Hello and welcome back to my channel, Deku Fanfic. Join us as we delve into the realms of fanfiction and fantasy, bringing you the best stories and discussions. Today, we're kicking off the first part of our series, What If Deku Became a Dad at Young Age? If you enjoy this video, please give it a like and subscribe for more content in the future. The author of this story is Lest at 719 from fanfiction.net. All the relevant links are in the description. Feel free to say hello to the author on their profile. Now, let's dive into the fanfic. Izuku and Katsuki. You could say life was unfair, unbalanced, or just plain cruel. With over 80% of the world is born with a quirk, being born without one was to be placed behind the starting line of life by a good margin. It was akin to being placed miles behind the line especially in Japan. Growing up in a society so predicated on quirks, almost all children would naturally dream of a powerful quirk so they could join the ranks of heroes. Having the right quirk would mean you would dominate whatever profession you chose to enter, your whole life could be mapped out by your quirk, even more so if you didn't have one. Izuku Midoriya was in the boat of not having one. His dreams of becoming a hero were dashed and broken. But with a child's stubborn determination, he clung to them. This made him the target of all the others with quirks, thus feeling superior to him. Izuku also had the unfortunate luck of being best friends with someone blessed with an incredibly powerful quirk, Explosion. Katsuki Bakugo was the son of his mother's closest friend since school, the two had married around the same time, gotten pregnant seriously close to each other, and given birth around the same time. So naturally, their children were put together, hoping they would grow and be best friends. It had worked for a bit, Katsuki was loud and rambunctious, and Izuku was quiet and shy. Together, they were constantly on the move, playing, dreaming of being heroes, and being what a lot would see as inseparable. All it took to separate them was Izuku not having a quirk. Katsuki, as mentioned, had a powerful quirk and was praised for the potential that it granted him. Everyone wanted to acknowledge him and his future greatness, other students, teachers, and random people on the street. As any dime store psychologist could tell you, showering a child with constant praise will never result in an altruistic and emotionally stable person. If they are never corrected for their mistakes or reprimanded, then everything they do is never wrong. If nothing they do is wrong, whatever action they take is right. Katsuki decided that Izuku was no longer worthy of being near him or anyone else. He drove everyone away from the boy and decided that Izuku's dream had insulted Katsuki's destined future. Katsuki's greatness could not be tarnished by the presence of some quirkless, useless person trying to stand next to him. Thus, Izuku became Deku, meaning useless. Katsuki's ire was not reserved for just Deku, it was for all those with what he deemed an inferior quirk, and that was everybody. As long as they acknowledged him as the top of the food chain, everything was fine. Sometimes, he had to beat that into them. But once again, if everything you do is never wrong, that makes it what? Right. Izuku, on the other hand, would constantly try to stand up to Katsuki and tell him that what he was doing was wrong. Not a good idea. Also, what was not a good idea was standing there and poking the dragon and being unable to do anything but get beat down. Now this would save whoever had been the previous target from Katsuki's wrath, but whoever had been committed would then flee, and more than likely join in on the bullying later so as not to find themselves the focus of Katsuki Bakugo. So in the race that is life, Izuku was drowning, figuratively and in reality, as one of Bakugo's cronies was holding him underwater after another rescue. Bakugo made no move to stop this. Instead, he was laughing, saying that maybe this was Deku's quirk, being able to breathe underwater. Is this attempted murder? Yes. Is it wrong? Yes, but if nothing you do is wrong. No one ever reprimanded Bakugo for his treatment of Deku, no one. Besides, Deku could hold his breath, so what was the harm? Izuku's struggles at first were not very dramatic as he figured they would let him up, I mean, it wasn't like they would kill him. Right. But when they didn't let him up, and his lungs burned and felt like they were about to explode, his life flashed before his eyes. It was a genuinely pathetic thing to watch, the life of a ten-year-old, full of ideals but lacking convictions, the only bright spot was his mother. She had failed to comfort him when the diagnosis came through but truly loved him. He had hidden the abuse from her to try and spare her as he felt he had already destroyed her life enough. He is a child and therefore let's be honest, stupid. Had he spoken up, things could have been different. Had she pressed further, things could have been different. Yet both were so scared to damage the other they just kept silent. As he was slipping into the cold embrace of unconsciousness, the last of his struggles fading through the haze and the water, an angel appeared like a bullet crashing into the bully holding him under. The angel, Aka Suijin. Suijin was getting acquainted with the new city she found herself in, her parents had to relocate often forcing her to relocate as well. She had grown used to it, not accepting it in any fashion but used to it. So as she had done this before, she had gone off to explore, it was essential to locate the local spot so she wouldn't be too lost in conversation at school. Wandering the large park was fun if not a kind of lonely experience, but pleasant nonetheless, the sounds of some explosion in the distance had initially caught her attention, and as he made her way over to the area, she found a beautiful stream running through the park. Following the sounds of laughter and taunts she stumbled across quite possibly the last thing she expected. A rather plump kid with wings was holding someone under the water whose thrashing was slowing considerably, an ash blonde laughing maniacally on a rock like a cheesy villain telling the fat one to hold him down longer. 
a third kid with splotchy skin and disturbingly long fingers was nothing but an echo chamber for the obvious leader of the group. Suijin's feet moved before she realized what was happening as she dashed forward, barreling into the cherub with all her might. Thankfully, her parents had taught her how to take care of herself from an early age for reasons not necessary at the moment. The sudden attack stunned all three boys. She used this to pull the drowning victim from the river and quickly set him on his back on the nearby shore. Vaguely she could hear the three assailants begin to shout some threats toward her. She ignored it, feeling the water in his lungs. She knew that an action would be a death sentence. The first activation of her quirk, she summoned two giant water golems from the river to chase off those three assholes, their yells and screams retreating quickly into the forest. Straining, she touched the boy's chest and gently pulled the water from his lungs. As it came out of his mouth, it took the form of a sea snake before plunging back into the river. She released her control of the golems and breathed heavily. Quickly, she checked to see if the drowning victim was breathing. Admittingly, in her panic, she didn't do a perfect job. Oh, a fuck, she thought. It is a good thing I took those CPR classes at the community center due to my quirk. Her mind made up, she tilted his head, opened his airway, pinched his nose, and bestowed the breath of life. Part of her mind quickly commented on how this was her first kiss, the other half replying that it wasn't technically a kiss but the closest she had gotten in 12 years of life. Izuku, another chance, just one more chance, to do things differently. He felt something warm in his chest, then again. Why was he tasting cherry? Why were his lips warm? He could feel it. He wasn't dead. His eyes snapped open, a girl with bluish black hair leaned over him. She turned her head to draw a breath, ready to deliver it before starting compressions. Her beautiful eyes opened and locked onto his wide-eyed expression. All Izuku could think of was how the sensation of her lips lingered on his and how he had a new love for cherry chapstick. He couldn't say anything, he couldn't move. Suijin. She was momentarily entranced by those beautiful emerald pools staring back at her. Her brain snapped her back quickly. Did this asshole fake me out to steal a kiss? I'm going to murder him, bring him back so I can murder him again. Did you just intentionally steal my first kiss, you bastard? Izuku. No, I know, I swear, I would never do something like that. I was unconscious, I am so sorry for what happened, your lips tasted nice. Oh no, please, oh no, I'm dead. I'm so dead. He scrambled away before kneeling, pressing his head into the dirt and begging forgiveness. Death didn't come well, at least at the moment. He lifted his head and dared to open one eye at his savior, executioner. He was expecting death, but truth be told praying for a taste of cherry chapstick. She had dark, almost black blue hair and brilliant blue eyes and wore a water hero shirt, jeans, and sneakers. She tilted her head back and just started laughing. The feeling of the crisis subsiding, the danger has passed for the most part. Oh, thank God you're alive. Do I get to continue to live? Maybe, maybe. Suijin Yamada, she said, pointing at herself. Izuku. I mean Midoriya, Izuku Midoriya. Look, man, you just stole my first kiss. You can call me Suijin, and I'll call you Izuku. I, I, it was my first kiss TT, too. Wow, aren't you so damn smooth? No, I swear I wasn't trying to take advantage of you. He tried to stand but sank to the floor as the adrenaline fled his body. Hold up, man, you did almost drown, I had to pull water out of your lungs. Besides, I don't think you could take advantage of a newborn kitten. Thank you, he managed weakly. This world is getting colder and heavier. I think I need to get home, he tried to stand again only to collapse. Let me help you, she got up and slipped his arm over her shoulder. He saw her paws and open her palm on her other hand towards them, and he felt the water leaving his clothing and hers forming into a water snake before splashing into the river. That's so cool, he managed. What is your quirk? Oh, I can control water, I just need water around. I can also animate it to attack for me. That is so cool, life came up into his voice. His eyes shined at her, and an enormous smile crossed his face. Thump. What the fuck was that? Why did my heart jump like that? Suijin thought. All he did was smile at me. Thanks, now, where do you live, Izuku? The trip home. He gave her his address, and she politely informed him she was new to town. He then provided directions as they journeyed to his home, he asked questions about her quirk. He was alive and smiling as they made their way out of the park and down the road. People gave them curious looks as they walked. He asked about her parents' quirks. She paused for a second before responding. Oh, my dad can control earth kind of like how I do water, and my mom can make herself invisible. She was lying. She knew she was. Her dad controlled water just like she and her mom could create it, she could make almost any fundamental element. They were the villain water dragon and Elementa. She knew they were. They weren't big time, well, not anymore. They used to be bigger, but then she came along. But that was the truth. They were. Somewhere doing something. They would be home at some point. They may have to move again. But she hoped that would not be the case, at least not this time. She felt terrible lying to Izuku, but what could she do? Having villains for parents was difficult. They continued their walk toward Izuku's apartment. The boy holding on to her side was still asking some questions, and she could hear him muttering to himself, and he was struggling to remain conscious. After much struggle, they finally reached the stairs. After a slow and difficult climb they arrived at his door. He struggled to get his key out of his bag and in the door. They made it inside, and he barely went to the couch before he collapsed, exhausted from his ordeal. 
She could hear him muttering something about the taste of cherries, which caused her to blush. She turned back to the boy covering him with a blanket and lightly kissed his cheek. Sleep tight, good looking. She went into his bag and found a notebook called Hero Analysis. Quickly finding a blank page, she jotted down a note for him and her phone number. She tore the page, folded it, and placed it on the coffee table. She left the apartment, locking the door with his key before sliding it under. I know it can't last, but I can be a girl for a while, and he can be a boy. It would be nice to have a friend for a little bit. He is alone like me, we could be less isolated for a little bit. She made her way downstairs onto the street, beginning her trek home. She would have to buy more cherry chap stick on her way home. She was almost out. Her heart thumped against her chest again. I am in so much trouble, she thought. So it began the day by the river two lonely people found each other. Time. At the age of ten, Izuku Midoriya met Suijin Yamada. She was a few years older than him at twelve. An unlikely friendship started that day she saved him. With Suijin in his corner, he began to change. Taking to heart what had happened, he was determined to live life differently. Suijin was determined to enjoy what time she would have with him. When her parents tried to relocate six months later, she fought back, and they ended up staying, setting this as their base and just traveling for work. The secret about boys, if it could be called that, when they find a girl they are infatuated with, they can be inspired to change and grow in ways never considered before. A prime example was a year later when Suijin mentioned that she thought guys who played the guitar were cute. Izuku, wholly sane and not entirely in love with his only friend, decided to start playing the guitar on a whim. A year after, when he learned to play one of her favorite songs, she knew she was also in love with her best friend. He sat there, his eyes closed, concentrating so hard to do it right. When he opened his eyes, her face was right before him. This time it was a kiss, cherry chapstick, he muttered afterwards making Suijin laugh and blush. He confessed right then and there, listing in rapid succession all the things he found great about her. She stopped him when he started talking ill about himself. He shut eyes again, asking if she would be his girlfriend. Suijin couldn't say anything but yes. It would be nice to say that after the initial meet-cute, Bakugo just left them alone. But he was not pleased that Deku stood up for himself more and that this stupid girl would not acknowledge his greatness. It was after another scuffle between them that Izuku made up his mind to start working out and learning to defend himself. He wanted to get stronger not only for himself but for Suijin. It was the very dojo he signed up with where he would meet his second friend Itsuka Kendo. She was the sensei's daughter and was assigned to get him up to speed and manage his workouts. Thankfully Itsuka and Suijin hit it off and the duo soon became a trio. The two girls pushed Izuku, picked him up when he was down, and encouraged him to move forward. With the year turning again and the seasons moving to summer, the trio went to the beach. Suijin had insisted that Itsuka come along to escape the dojo. He was with his girlfriend and friend, both girls, and both were beautiful in their bikinis. Izuku was developing some muscle, not so much a string bead anymore but showing much promise. With the constant lessons from Itsuka, he was progressing quickly in the dojo. Unfortunately, some jerks also noticed the girls and started to harass them. Before they could respond, Izuku stepped in. He didn't even think before telling the jerks to back off from his girlfriend and friend. When the fight broke out, Suijin went to jump in immediately, but Itsuka stopped her. Let him do this, she said. Izuku fought two-on-one against boys older than him, he took some hits but won. He had won, he had been able to defend someone successfully for the first time. Suijin and Itsuka hadn't stepped in. They had let him do this on his own. Suijin's heart beat her chest, she rewarded him with deep, passionate kisses that evening. They made out for hours, their hearts nearly thumping from their chests. I love you, he whispered, thinking he had made a mistake when he saw Suijin's tears, but when she said it back, he understood. They held each other, drifting off into their own little world. At 13, Izuku had confessed his love and had it returned. Bakugo still came after him, but now he would fight back. He couldn't beat Bakugo, but he wasn't just going to take it anymore. He felt pride when Bakugo came to school with a black eye. Sadly, as quickly as Itsuka had joined them, she had to leave. She could no longer train with her father. She had to train with her grandfather to take over the dojo one day. The departure was filled with tears and promises of letters and phone calls, whereas for most 14-year-olds in the case of Itsuka and Izuku and 16 for Suijin, this promise would be kept. Izuku takes a small job to earn money for a present for Suijin, little did he know she had done the same thing for him. She presented him with a new guitar on his birthday, the most fantastic thing he had ever seen. Izuku, aware of her love for dolphins, presented her with a gold necklace with a dolphin with actual aquamarines for eyes. Sadly the year opened with some sadness with Itsuka leaving, and it closed with pain as after a terrible fight with Bakugo, who had tried to destroy the guitar Izuku was left with a horrible burn mark in the shape of a hand on his back. The year Izuku turned 15. Specific years have the power to define our lives and shape our futures. For Izuku, this year and the ones that follow will have a lasting impact on his identity. Although previous years have brought significant changes to his world, these upcoming years will be particularly defining. Not soon after he had healed from his fight with Bakugo, a man came to the door to tell him and his mother, Inko, that his father had died in a tragic accident overseas. Izuku hadn't talked to him in about 10 years, he had left when Izuku was diagnosed as quirkless. 
He sent the money on time, but he made no attempt to reach out to his family. His mother had already accepted that reconciliation would never happen, but the news still hit her hard. If there was an upside, it was due to some negligence on the job, and his father had a comprehensive life insurance policy, with Inco and him as the sole beneficiaries. Inco used this financial windfall to purchase a house. The move was hectic and fun in its way. As spring approached, the couple began to make plans. Of course, her parents being villains, it would catch up to them eventually. On a Monday night, Suijin was informed they were leaving that Sunday, they had to leave town. She begged to stay, saying that Inko would take her in, but her father shut her down. She was coming with them. She ran into the night to Izuku, and she could only weep when he opened the door. When she finally shared why she was crying, he couldn't help but cry as well. Inko came to Izuku and told him she was going away for the weekend to unwind and that he would have the house to himself. She hugged her son tight, saying nothing else. On Friday, Suijin came over. First, they just sat on the couch for a moment. As soon as their lips touched, they both knew what they wanted. He picked her up off the couch and carried her to his room, her legs wrapped around his torso, pulling off his shirt. As their bodies found the bed, they sank into a night of passion, giving each other their first. Most of the weekend, they don't leave the bed, it is like cramming a lifetime of love and passion into a day and a half. Sunday is almost feverish in their power and declarations of love, maybe if they can love each other enough, she won't have to go. Izuku promises to go to whatever college she attends, she makes him swear to pursue his dream of UA. First, to follow his dreams. She will still be there for him and wait for him for as long as it takes. He swears not to make her wait long, that maybe she can move back when once she gets out of school. All the feverish promises that could be made are made. When her parents arrive in a moving truck, reality crashes around them, they kiss and hold each other. Tears flow, and dreams take a tenuous hold, they will make it work. We have two, they say. They will text, call, send letters, hell carrier pigeons if necessary. She steps out the door, and he runs to kiss her again, I'm going to marry you, he whispers. I will wait for you, Izuku, till the stars burn out, she says. Please wait for me, she begs him. As you wish, he says, she smiles for him. She walks to the car, looking back at him. Once she gets in, she rolls down the window and yells that she loves him in a broken voice. He tries to be strong, but he yells it back as the van pulls away, he hears her voice yell it again. He makes it inside as he breaks completely, stumbling to the couch. He doesn't even remember falling asleep. The pounding on the door rouses him from his sleep. He looks at his phone. It's 2 a.m. Everyone knows a few things. There is never a good thing to happen from a phone call or an unknown pounding at the door at 2 a.m. When he opens it to see a police officer, he knows that whatever fragments of his world he is clinging to are about to shatter. All he hears is that his mother is in a terrible accident, and he must get to the hospital immediately. As he rushes into the hospital, he sees Bakugo and his dad. He is confused as to why they are there then he sees Mitsuki, Bakugo's mom. She is in a hospital bed, her head is bandaged, her arm looks broken, and her foot is in a walking boot. He can't focus on it too well, he is rushed into his mother's room. A nurse is holding her hand, the doctor stops Izuku telling him that he doesn't have much time left. It is all dawning on the boy, he crosses the room quickly. Inko's eyes are bruised and barely open, splints and tubes are everywhere, dear god, there are so many tubes. Gently Izuku takes his mother's hand, telling her he is there. Inko grabbed her son's hand tightly, she knew her time was short. She just needed to see him again. Listen, baby, I am sorry I have to go, but I will always be looking down and watching you. Be good and follow your dreams. Izuku tells her to stay. He is begging her to stay. Inko gathers her strength. Izuku, I am so sorry. I should have told you sooner. You can be a hero. I know that you will be an amazing hero. Be the best hero you can, Izuku. Smile for me once and show me that everything will be all right. Izuku does it fighting back the tears he digs deep and smiles for his mother. She whispers, I love you. Before he could respond, the machine started to beep like crazy. They ushered him out as they attempted to save Inko one last time. Twenty minutes later, the door opens to silence. She is gone. Izuku sits silently with his mother's body, trying to say goodbye. He exits the room in a daze. As the hospital begins to do its due diligence, an officer approaches him offering his sympathy. He asks the officer what happened. Mitsuki and his mother had gone out for a girl's weekend. Both had too much to drink, and Mitsuki drove them home. His mother had fallen asleep when the accident occurred. The car had gone off the road and down an embankment, and his mother was thrown from the vehicle. The officer kindly sits with the Izuku offering what comfort he can, when the hospital hand over and Ko's belongings. The kind man drives Izuku home. Numbly he walks into the empty house, feeling it will be that way forever. Itsuka is gone, Suijin is gone, and now his mother has been taken away. He collapses on his bed and cries himself to sleep. He finally awakes sometime in the evening, he has missed calls from Suijin. He calls her back, she immediately tells him in his voice that something is wrong, when he tells her, he can hear her crying. She promises that somehow someway, she will get back to him, she vows to call Itsuka. They talk for hours till he falls asleep with her on the phone. The morning comes, Izuku doesn't awake until close to 10 a.m. He wakes up and stumbles through, taking a shower before heading to school to talk with the faculty. It is a short conversation, he is ahead in all his classes, and they don't care about him anyways. They agree that taking some time off would be for the best. 
Izuku nods and leaves, desperate to get back home. It is then that Bakugo confronts him in the halls. Bakugo begins to lay into Izuku verbally. Izuku is in shock as he registers what Bakugo is saying. He is complaining about how this will impact his life, that his family is going to have to pay Izuku out because Mitsuki was at fault, that his life is being inconvenienced, and that if Izuku takes the money, Bakugo is going to kill him. This blonde bastard then starts going off on where Suijin is, how she probably wised up and left him, and that it was Inko's fault for dying. His words, if that dumb bitch had bothered be wearing a seatbelt, this wouldn't be messing up my life. Izuku snapped, rushing Bakugo in a frenzy, he took him down immediately. He is not just trying to punch Bakugo. He's trying to put his fist through him. He is attacking Bakugo like a rabid animal. The blonde's blood is flying. Izuku has broken Bakugo's nose, fractured his orbital socket, and busted open his lip. Bakugo tries to blast him off, and it fractures Izuku's shoulder, but Izuku won't stop coming. Eventually, the faculty tries to separate them, and Bakugo uses this opportunity to get into cheap shots. Izuku looks crazed in his frenzied state, tears streaming down his face. All Izuku can do is scream he is going to kill Bakugo. He is fighting like a madman to get free and get his hands on Bakugo. I want your blood. Izuku yells. He longs to hear Bakugo scream, but then something happens. A green aura surrounds Izuku's hand, and he gestures toward Bakugo in a claw-like fashion. Suddenly, blood begins to rip out of Bakugo's body. Izuku realizes he is doing it, manifesting a quirk like his mom's. With Bakugo's screams echoing in his ears, Izuku passes out. The sound of hospital monitors coax Izuku back to consciousness. As he comes through, he is handcuffed to the bed, and an officer immediately begins to lay into the boy, throwing terms like jail and unlawful assault with a quirk. Izuku's patience is so thin that it cannot be measured with the naked eye. If something like that was even possible, he snaps back. He rips open his hospital gown, showing all the scars Bakugo has given him over the years, yelling back about all that has been done to him. Before the officer can roar back, the door opens, and in walks a tall thin man in a sharp suit, his hair is thinning on the top and sides, and he looks American. He introduces himself as Kobayashi, saying that he is Mr. Midoriya's lawyer, and that the officer's presence is no longer needed and to remove the cuffs. The officer is about to complain when his radio springs to life, and the captain tells him to remove the cuffs from the suspect and vacate the room. Now, Mr. Midoriya, I was retained by your mother, and in the event of her untimely demise, I was to serve you as well, he speaks. Izuku is not only surprised by his words but the man is speaking with a British, Indian accent. If you do not wish to retain my services, I would ask that you at least allow me to settle this pressing legal matter before you dismiss me. Izuku nods. I have spoken to the other party, and in exchange for you not pressing charges against their son, they will not press any charges against you. Also, you will not be held responsible for any medical bills resulting from this incident. The man says, Now, here is my card. When you are free from the hospital, please call me so we can go over the terms of your mother's will and sign some papers. A few days later, Izuku sits with Kobayashi as they go over the estate and his mother's will. Thankfully the lawyer explains that his mother had already planned and organized her funeral arrangements taking all the pressure off of Izuku. As they talked, it became apparent that beyond his quirk awakening, his mother was looking down on him. What it all amounts to is that everything is taken care of, bills, repairs, future endeavors, everything. A monthly stipend will account for his food and spending money, including clothing and small necessities like haircuts. If he requires anything else, he must submit a written request to Kobayashi, as he will be the executor until Izuku comes of age. His mother also made investments to see things through for years. With only a few days until the funeral, Suijin and Itsuka return, and the girls do all they can to support Izuku as he prepares for the fateful day. Itsuka leaves the couple at night so they may seek comfort in each other's embrace. It differs from the last time, not frenzied, comforting, tender, and passionate. It also provides a welcome distraction from the grief, a moment of respite. Izuku is surprised at how many of his mother's co-workers come to pay their respects. Mitsuki comes but stays only briefly, she apologizes to Izuku. He can see she wants to say more desperately, but she can't find the words, so she leaves, hoping to not cause a disturbance. Izuku is torn, he wants to yell at her, scream and berate her, but at the same time, he wants to hug his auntie Mitsu. Regardless of the hell he has gone through with her son, she was always kind and loving towards him. Sadly the day after, Itsuka has to leave them again, the following day, it is Suijin's turn. Izuku sits in the house alone, the silence is oppressive, so he decides to walk. When he opens the door sitting on his doorstep is a beautiful oak box. Bringing it in, he carefully sets it on the counter, studying it. He sees no markings, he opens it. The box contains a letter, an envelope stuffed with cash, and a bottle of Blanton's single barrel. He opens the letter. Izuku Midoriya, my deepest and most sincere condolences in this hour of grief. Know that though your mother has departed this world, she is still looking down on you from on high, watching you see you grow into the man she always knew you were inside. The letter is simple and typewritten, with no signature. The paper feels nice, but that is all Izuku can tell. He sets it aside, and there is easily 500,000 yen opening the envelope. His attention turns to the bottle, his mind racing. He had never had a drink before, and that was to change swiftly that night. 
It turns out getting alcohol underage is relatively easy. All Izuku would do is find someone down on their luck outside the liquor store, give them money to buy what they wanted, and they would procure him what he wanted. Slowly it all begins to blur together. Suijin's heart breaks as she talks to him in his drunken haze daily, answering his phone calls in the middle of the night and responding to drunk texts. She knows he is hurting and just trying to bury it away, but she tells him every day that he should stop. She doesn't yell or threaten, but she tells him he should stop daily and that she loves him. She is trying to get back to him to be with him to ease his pain, but she can't at the moment. Izuku wakes up one day, he is in his mother's room. He hadn't been in there since before the funeral. He is lying at the foot of her bed, curled up, holding her sweater. As his eyes focus more, he sees her dresser just across from the foot of the bed, it is a photo of Inko and him. It is from a fireworks festival years ago, he is little holding her hand, and they are looking up at the fireworks exploding in the sky. He has no idea who took the photo. It could be his father from his age in the image. His body order and the smell of booze assault his nose. Looking at the picture, he just thinks she is watching. Izuku makes his way to the quirk registration office to update his status. While looking at what to name his quirk, one word comes to mind, attraction. That was what his mom's quirk was called. He can affect small objects like her, but he seems stronger. It doesn't matter that he registers it. The clerk goes to tell him the name is already taken, but Izuku quickly explains. The clerk nods her head and stamps his registration form. He puts the bottle down and doesn't pick it back up. He realizes he has been drowning his sorrows for the last six months. He calls Suijin, thanking her for standing beside him, and he tells her the realization of what has happened. They can only talk briefly as she is about to step into a doctor's office. With a giggle, she assures Izuku that she is just fine. The appointment is with her woman's doctor for her yearly checkup. Izuku blushes and asks her to call him after. She does, and they talk and text daily, just as promised. Itsuka can only communicate when she comes into town. Suijin and Izuku have fun, almost making her phone blow up as all the texts and communications download when she returns to service. After talking it over with Suijin, Izuku enrolls in online schooling, having decided not to return to Aldara. He exercises when he feels emotionally overwhelmed and returns to the dojo. Itsuka's dad is forgiving of his absence and welcomes him back. The end of the year is the hardest, Izuku does his best, but his mood is low. The first holidays are always tricky, the feeling of such loneliness as he is alone for the first time during the winter holidays. His mind drifts back to the bottle, he takes it and buries it in a box in the back of the closet. Suijin goes silent for a few days, citing that she is experiencing an Itsuka-type situation as her family went to visit relatives. He laughs as she sends him a text proclaiming December 15th the best day ever. She never thoroughly explained it. The year slowly passes, with Izuku at the shrine offering prayers for a better year. The year he turns 16. Or, the day Izuku met a sludge villain. Online classes allowed Izuku to do so at his own pace, and with his mind wholly focused on types, he was tearing through them at a stunning rate. He only hated having to go to testing sites to complete the class. This day he found himself leaving Aldera. Thankfully he had been able to arrive after classes started and were leaving before school let out. Next to zero interaction with his former schoolmates had made it more bearable, not running into Bakugo had made it heavenly. He decided to take a long way home, not knowing that this choice would kick his life in an entirely different direction. He was absorbed in his phone, texting Suijin that he had finished his testing. She had just responded that she needed to talk to him tonight about some great news. An unknown voice snapped him back to reality and the precarious position he had wandered into. What a fine-looking skin suit. Don't worry, kid, it will be over quickly. Izuku whirled towards the voice, a green sludge enveloped his vision, and it wrapped itself around his body. He felt it was trying to force itself into his mouth and nose. He quickly called upon his quirk, which allowed him to fight, but he still couldn't breathe. As his vision blurs, he can hear this thing taunting him for his struggle. The villain doesn't see someone climbing out of the manhole behind him. Everything fades to black for Izuku. He startles awake and feels something strike his cheek. Wake up, kid. His eyes snap open, but he still believes he is dreaming as he looks up at the number one hero in Japan, not the world, All Might. Thank goodness, kid thought I was going to call an ambulance. He put up a good fight, though. Izuku immediately felt like a kid again. He reached for his notebook. Can I get your autograph, sir? Already done, kid, I read your analysis. You got a sharp mind, a good trait for a hero. Now I must be off, careful walking through any tunnels in the future. Wait, All Might I just have one question. Izuku reached out to grab the hero's shoulder. Unfortunately, All Might had already turned and leaped, pulling Izuku into the air with him. Izuku almost fell, but desperately he managed to snag onto All Might's leg. What the hell are you doing, kid? Let go. Are you insane that would kill me? All Might quickly finds a rooftop for them to land on, and the kids tumble free. Why did you grab onto me like that? I was going to ask you a question, and I had just put my hand on your shoulder when I leaped off, I started falling, so I grabbed onto your leg. Honestly, I wasn't trying to do anything. Well, you're safe now, head down the stairs, I have to go. All Might, hold on, I was quirkless for most of my life, my quirk just awakened nine months ago, it isn't powerful, but do you think I can still be a hero? All Might mind raced, he had to get out here. His time limit was about to. 
and then it did. Suddenly, smoke erupted from All Might, startling Izuku as he jumped back, and when the smoke cleared, All Might was gone. Instead, there was a skeletal man with hair and eyes like All Might wearing his suit. What the hell is going on? Izuku yelled. Are you some sort of imposter? Izzy, kid, it's me. Now I will ask you to keep what you have seen here to yourself. Of course, but what happened to you? Is this why you have slowed down over the last few years? Izuku asked. I am impressed that you noticed, but yes, All Might lifted his shirt revealing a massive wound on his side. I got this about five years ago, when I was battling a villain. Was it Toxic Chainsaw? You know your stuff, kid, a true fanboy. Izuku blushed. But no, it wasn't him, it was someone else, the strongest villain I ever fought. Ultimately, I won, but it cost me my spleen, half my rib cage, a kidney, part of my diaphragm, stomach, a lung, and parts of my liver and intestines. What is your quirk? It's similar to my mom's, I can attract small objects to me, Izuku said, demonstrating by pulling some gravel on the roof to his hand. All might pointed to his wound. This was done after I had trained my quirk in myself for decades. While it is true that even if you have such a quirk that with years of training, you may be able to be a hero, with such an unrepresented late awakening, you are so far behind the starting line. I am sorry young man, I don't think heroics are in your future. With your mind, you can still become a doctor, a quirk analyst, or even a detective. It may not be the life you seek, but it is one where you can do good. Izuku was stunned, part of him who had lived for so long quirkless was devastated. Doubt was creeping into his mind, clouding his thoughts. Then he thought of Suijin, Itsuka, all the time spent in the dojo, working out, pushing himself, then he thought of his mother. With her last breaths, she told him he could be an amazing hero, he hadn't yet manifested his quirk. The tear immediately stopped. Izuku raised his head and looked at the number one hero in the world, staring straight into his eyes. You are wrong, I may be behind the starting line, but I just have to work harder, I have people who believe in me, my mother believed in me. You watch All Might, I am going to be a hero. A lack of a quirk wouldn't stop me, and now that I have one, I am sure as hell not going to stop. I am sorry for all this happening, I promise your secret will be safe. Izuku turned to leave the rooftop. All Might was impressed by the fire the boy spoke with, he had to admire that even though the kid was behind the eight ball, he wasn't about to give up. What's your name, kid? Izuku Midoriya, he called back as the door closed. Izuku made his way down the streets, his heart was pounding. He had just talked back to All Might. Now he had to back it up, a fire roared in Izuku's belly. His mind began to race at how he could train his quirk, turning that analytical mind inwards. He started formulating ideas, his brainstorming was cut short by the sound of explosions. Very distinct explosions. A sound that no matter what happened in his life, Izuku would never forget, ones that he could identify at any time, anywhere. Following the sound, he thought he was prepared when he was not. As he pushed through the crowd, he saw Death Arms and Kami Woods holding back, not engaging whatever was happening. Izuku saw it, the sludge villain that had attacked him earlier, the one All Might had. Oh no, when I almost fell and grabbed his leg. I must have knocked him free. I am partially responsible for this. Why are the heroes not doing anything? He looked at Death Arms and Kami Woods. They complained about their ineffective quirks, and Mount Lady couldn't get near in her giant form. He could hear the sludge villain telling Bakugo to stop struggling. He could listen to the explosions getting weaker, he saw the fear in Bakugo's eyes. Before Izuku could think, before Izuku could reason, his legs moved before his mind caught up. Izuku dashed forward, slipping past the barricade. The heroes called after him, which he ignored. As he ran, his mind raced through all his countless notes. Distract the target. He grabbed his backpack and threw it at the monster, its contents spilling through the air. Luckily, a pencil flew and stabbed the villain in his eye. It screamed in pain, Izuku threw his hand forward in a clawing motion. The sludge tore from Bakugo's face, allowing the explosive teen to take a much-needed breath. D.K.U. What the hell are you doing here? Trying to save your life? The heroes weren't doing anything, my feet moved on their own. I don't need your damn help, get out of here. Look, let both of us get out of here, and then we can argue about this. The sludge villain recovered and swung his arm. At Izuku, sliding underneath as Bakugo managed to momentarily free his arm and fire off another blast that seemed to irritate the villain. His eyes are vulnerable, wait for a second, I can target small objects. Izuku reached out with his quirk. He felt it grab the villain's eye, he ripped the eye free with a pulling motion and a scream that would haunt the boy filled the area. Izuku turned his attention to Bakugo, using his hand and quirk to free the trapped boy's arms and head, he was pulling for all he could. Rocket us out of here damn it. Izuku screamed. I don't take orders from you, asshole. Bakugo responded. Bakugo knew it was desperation time, so he poured all he could, placing both hands in front of him. Die you, bastard, he yelled as a massive explosion erupted from his palms. The shock reverberated through his body, dislocating one of his shoulders as Izuku and he was thrown free. They tumbled to the ground in a heap, and Izuku managed to see a massive appendage falling towards them. He quickly pushed Bakugo one way and himself the other as the concrete spiderweb from the impact. The two teens struggled to gain bearings when a dozen appendages rose to crush them. 
that Hugo rose to a knee, throwing his hand out to blast the appendages about to rain down on that useless Deku. Izuku reached out to try and grab the ones heading for Bekugo. He knew he couldn't target the whole appendage, but he could target a ring on them severing them from the primary units. They both prepared for their end. Thank you for reminding me what it is to be a hero, young man, Detroit Smash. All Might appeared before the villain, and in a single punch, they blew the villain away. When the wind settled, rain began to fall. All Might just changed the weather with a point, the boys thought. It was a blur of activity as heroes rushed in as well as paramedics. The heroes began to reprimand Izuku for running and almost getting himself killed. Izuku couldn't believe it. He had run and because they were doing nothing. What was I supposed to do? Let him die. You guys weren't doing anything. Watch your mouth, kid, snapped death arms. Our quirks couldn't do anything to that villain. I distracted him with a pencil. You're a goddamn pro. You mean to tell me that if your quirk isn't suited to something, you just stand there and let someone die. I have had enough of this. How about I arrest you for vigilantism? Arrest me then, I would rather go to jail than stand by and let someone die when I could have tried to help. That is the true essence of a hero, young man, now I don't think we need to bring charges death arms, the young man is emotional at the moment. And he does have a point, while I may have defeated that villain, I would not have arrived in time if this youngster had not bought young Bekugo extra time and held off the villain. Especially while three pro heroes watched. The words seemed to sink into Death Arms, who knew he couldn't go against the number one hero, and if he did file charges, it would look like he was being petty that a kid had run in and done something while he stood by. All Might gave Izuku a nod, Izuku got up and slipped away, starting to make the trek home after an incredibly long day. Tonight's conversation with Suijin was going to be epic. He stopped to get a drink from a vending machine, taking a long drink of water, he heard his name being called. Not his real name, but D.K.U. Izuku turned to the voice of his tormentor. What do you want, Bekugo? I didn't need your help back there. I could have freed myself, it was All Might that saved me, not you. Izuku was shocked. Oh my god, Bekugo, I am so tired of you and your bullshit. What did you say? Are your explosions making you deaf? I don't care anymore, we are done. A day you couldn't pull your head out of your ass because my mom's death might inconvenience you in some manner. That was it, Bekugo. We are done, stay the hell away from me. Izuku bellowed. He didn't notice Bakugo flinch. Go home, go home to Auntie, hug her, and be thankful that you have someone at home waiting for you to get there, you arrogant piece of shit. Izuku stalked off, leaving Bakugo behind, Bakugo didn't say anything. He stood silently for a minute before walking off, the fading light of day casting a long shadow. Izuku was a block away when suddenly All Might burst from an alley. Never fear, citizen, for I am here. He barely managed to get his catchphrase out before he coughed up blood and reverted to his skeletal form. Hold up for a minute, young Midoriya. How did you get away from all those reporters and fans? Years of experience, young man, but that is neither here nor there. I came to apologize to you, young Midoriya. I had the nerve to tell you that you couldn't be a hero just because you had manifested your quirk late. Then just moments later, you reminded me of what a true hero is. You can be a hero, young man, you can be a fantastic hero. It was a dream, it had to be, but it was a dream come true. Here was All Might telling him he could be a hero, another person who believed in what once was an impossible dream. Thank you All Might, as I told you on the roof, I will be a hero, just you watch. I have no doubt, but I would like to help you. I am not just in Mustafa to catch villains, but to find a successor, I believe I have found that in you, young Midoriya. You want me to be your successor. What do you mean? Being the fan of mine that you are, I am sure you noticed how I never answered what my quirk is. You always deflect the question with a joke or something. Exactly, my quirk is called one for all, and the truth is I wasn't born with it, it was given to me by my teacher. What do you mean? Given to you. I don't understand. It means what I just said, now I will tell you something few people know. My quirk can be transferred from one person to another, this has happened seven other times before me, and I would like to pass it on to you. I wasn't lying when I said that starting line was far ahead of you, but with your heart, my help, I think not only can you run in the race, you can dominate it. It makes sense that you would keep it quiet, it would change what people think and know about quirks. You believe me worthy. Yes, young Midoriya. You lived most of your life being quirkless, I can see that you have worked out and trained despite that. You have the heart and the dedication, now, it won't be easy. We must train hard for the next two years before your entrance exam. But if you trust me, I guarantee you can pass any entrance exam. Now what do you say? Will you become the ninth inheritor? Yes, all might. Yes, I will. Izuku spoke with conviction, a few tears were shed. He looked to the sky, keep watching mom. All Might and Izuku exchanged contact information. The pro told Izuku to meet him this weekend at Takoba Municipal Beach Park at 5 a.m. They would begin then. Izuku smiled and shook the pro's hand before making his way home. All Might watched the boy disappearing into the distance. He knew his work would be cut out for the lad. Izuku's body was probably close to accepting one for all, but he had to train him to control it. All Might know that would be a problem. He could handle one for all right from the beginning. His teacher had been surprised. All Might was a great hero, not a very good teacher, but he knew someone who was. He stared at his phone as he made his way home. This was a phone call he was partly dreading having to make. Home. On his way home, Izuku stops and grabs dinner from a burger joint. His mind is racing about the day as he enters the silent home. He knows who he needs to share it with. 
He immediately dials Suijin. She knows he is smiling from how his voice sounds over the phone. She can hear the joy in his voice, and very coyly, she asks about his day. Over the next hour, she listens to the unforgettable day, the tests, the sludge villain encounters one and two, and the all-might encounters one and two. He tells her about one for all, he has to. He knows he should keep it secret but can't from the woman he loves. Suijin listens to everything, her heart racing and soaring, plummeting as he recounts everything. In her arms sits a newborn baby girl, their daughter. Their night of passion had resulted in her being pregnant. She was going to tell him that was what she needed to talk to him about. To let him know what had happened, but she knew what he would do. Drop everything and run to her. Toss all his dreams aside and run to them. As much as she wanted to tell him, she knew she couldn't, especially now that All Might would pass his quirk on to him, not now that the number one hero would train him. She would keep quiet for now and tell him later, even if he hated her for it. She would keep this a secret for now, she loved him, and he loved her. It wasn't right, she knew he had the right to decide. She was going to take that away from him, she had to. When he asks about what she is so excited about, she lies. I got a job babysitting this little girl, it pays well, and it will allow me to save up some money for college. Oh, you should see her, Izuku. She is so beautiful. Her heart flutters when he asks for pictures, she carefully chooses one before sending it. You are right, Suijin, she is beautiful, what is her name? Inari, Suijin replies, catching her voice before it breaks and betrays her, she holds her emotions in check when he comments on how pretty the name is. I can't wait till I graduate from UA. I will marry you, and we will have our babies. Tell me that again, baby, she says, tears leaking from the corner of her eyes. As you wish. Life is what happens when you are busy making other plans. Life is a way of happening regardless of the plans anyone has. Izuku and Suijin were no exception, with his training and raising Inari in school. The fantastic thing is that they still talked every day through it all. Izuku had started cleaning the seaside junkyard known as Tacoba Municipal Beach Park, meeting All Might there at 5 a.m. The plan had been laid out for the boy. The mornings would be dedicated to cleaning the beach. This would be his physical workouts, increasing his muscle mass to get him physically closer to being ready to accept one for all. After lunch, they would do quirk training. Izuku had questioned this. He knew that he needed to work on his quirk, but he hadn't expected All Might to want to train him. All Might told him that his quirk training would be just as necessary, if not more so, than his physical training. He told his successor how his teacher Nana had been born with the simple quirk of float, it had performed exactly as labeled. Yet, after receiving one for all, her quirk was empowered, she could no longer float but could fly. All Might reasoned that when Izuku inherited one for all, attraction would also receive some power up. They needed to be as ready as possible. Suijin had her struggles, raising a child alone is difficult. Factor in trying to attend online classes, villains for parents, a long-distance boyfriend, and having to lie daily to the one you love can take a toll on a person. And last Suijin checked, she was, in fact, a person. Yet sadly, the more you do something, the better you get at it, even lying to the one you love. The lies worked partly because of a few factors. Izuku was physically and mentally exhausted daily from training and schoolwork. The second factor was that, as the old saying goes, love is blind. Also, Izuku could not tell if his girlfriend was acting weird, as he had no other reference point. Suijin would say to him about his daughter's growth and development daily. For Izuku, it seemed a little strange that Suijin would talk so much about the little girl, but when Suijin kindly explained how much attention Inari demanded, a large part of her day revolved around that Izuku understood. While he couldn't quite understand Suijin's joy in sharing tidbits about Inari's day, he loved how happy it made Suijin. It started to be a favorite part of his day. The end of every call would turn to dreams of the future, hopes for tomorrow, and longing for each other's embrace. It took three months for the beach to be halfway cleared. All Might smiled at his successor and proclaimed that time had come for Izuku to inherit one for all. They traveled to Might Tower in Tokyo. It was at that point that Izuku was introduced to two people who would become very important for the rest of his life. A youthful heroine, Recovery Girl, and All Might's second teacher, the jet hero, Gran Torino. Aside from having to eat a piece of All Might's hair which he found perfectly disgusting, it took a few hours, which they passed in a reinforced room with Izuku attempting to dodge Gran Torino as part of his combat training. Around the end of the first hour, Izuku began to use his quirk to tug at various parts of the hero, his costume, his hair, or even forcibly closing his eyes. Torino smiled as the boy was thinking on his feet, then to reward him, he proceeded to move about the room even faster. As Izuku lay panting on the floor, he felt that something exploded in his gut and behind his eyes. It was an explosion of pain followed by warmth, it was an overwhelming of his senses, he could feel something all around him, thousands if not millions of things around him. Slowly he realized it was the air, he could pull on the very air or push it away, his quirk had changed. When the blinding pain subsided, Izuku looked up and smiled at All Might, it worked. Izuku was trying to run before he could walk, and when All Might asked him to throw a punch, Izuku decided to go full power right away. Gran flew in and kicked the boy right in the gut, stopping him. Recovery bobbed him with her cane and wanted to take him to be checked for brain damage. Izuku sat on the ground catching his breath and rubbing his head. I apologize, young Midoriya, going full strength like that, it was more likely that you would severely hurt yourself. 
you need to limit your output to an acceptable level to not damage yourself. You could have said something, Izuku said as he stood up, attempting to draw upon the quirk once again. Once again, he roared to 100%, just holding it, Izuku thought he would explode. It proceeded this way for the rest of the day until Izuku became frustrated. Relax, young Midoriya, Rome wasn't built in a day, you didn't master your quirk in a day either. We need to take our time so we don't rush and set you back before you start even more. Izuku wasn't happy, but he understood he was behind in some aspects and was trying to rush to catch up. That night Suijin immediately wanted to know how everything had gone. She let him do his best to deflect before forcing the issue. She listened to his ranting and complaint before she let a giggle slip. Suijin, this isn't funny. Izuku, you are sometimes the dumbest smart guy I know, quite trying to be the brute squad. Huh, you are trying to brute force this when you need technique. I can control water, right? Yes, why do I make water take forms? I could pull up the whole river and throw it at someone, but it would cause me to pass out, and I couldn't direct it very well anyway. You are trying to throw the whole river. Just drink a little water drink. Don't try and drink the lake. Silence. So instead of standing in the river and trying to control it, divert some to the side. Essentially, make a small channel and let it flow naturally. Oh, and don't just direct it to your arm. Spread it out all over. Water will always follow the path of least resistance. If you only have it go to one spot, it may overflow. It can also carve its own path. How did I fall in love with such a smart and beautiful girl? Some bullies tried to drown you. You know I have never been happier for a near-death experience. Why didn't you apply to UA? You could be an amazing hero Suogen. It never appealed to me the same way, I love my quirk, but I don't think I could go out there every day and fight villains with it. I want to pursue child development. I leave the fighting of villains to my big strong future husband. Now start digging some channels. I want to know if this works. Izuku laughed and placed the phone on the bed, placing the call on speaker. He closed his eyes and began to imagine a river flowing through him. He then started creating imaginary channels all through his body. Suijin told him to dig into every part of his body, fingers and toes. It felt different, slowly connecting it to the river and letting it flow through him. Instead of a rush, it came like a cool trickle. When he opened his eyes, green electricity was running all over his body. He let out a cheer, Suijin was laughing, hearing him let out cries of joy and praising her as the reason for his breakthrough. When he went to work out the following day, he proudly demonstrated his technique. All Might smiled and congratulated him. Recovery Girl was thankful he wasn't hurting himself. Torino smiled sadistically. Now let us see if you can use it, Zygote. Bring it, old man, Izuku replied. The old man brought it. Throughout the year, they diligently worked on cleaning the beach and training. By the end, he had made significant progress in controlling approximately 15% of the one-for-all power while continuing to improve his other quirk. He was getting closer to reaching his goal. Thankfully the holidays were not so bad this year, he didn't spend them alone. Instead he spent them with All Might or Mr. Yagi as Iesku now called him in Torino. Recovery Girl even came by as well. It wasn't the same but it was much nicer than being alone. Suijin continued to raise their daughter, the lies flowing like a river of honey. It broke her heart, but she knew it was what she needed to do and what was best. Inari had become a part of her parents' lives, although her father seemed unhappy and kept his distance from his granddaughter. On the other hand, her mother adored the little girl wholeheartedly. However, their criminal activities continued despite Suijin's pleas to stop and lead an everyday life. Suijin kept dreaming of a different life, pushing towards it, the year rolled over as time waited for no one. Her father approached her with one final task. Once completed, he and her mother would retire from their life of villainy. Suijin agreed, despite feeling conflicted, as Izuku's birthday was only a few weeks away. If the plan succeeded, she would reveal the truth to him. However, lying to him was taking a toll on her conscience. In addition to her duty to her father, Suijin also needed Izuku's support. Soon Izuku, everything will be out in the open, I only hope you forgive me. The week passed, and Izuku hadn't heard anything from Suijin, he had managed to get in touch with Itsuka, and she hadn't heard anything. He was starting to panic, they had never gone this long without communicating, he was hoping that with his birthday approaching, she might show up to surprise him. He focused his attention on his final exams. The thought was that if he could finish his schooling early, he could devote more time to training. He had managed to increase his control of one for all to 20% in the first half of the new year. He had just gotten home from the testing center the day before and was reviewing his grades. He had passed everything with an A and had been sweating classic lit. It had now been eight days, and still no word, he had tried to call for a wellness check, but the police in that area refused to do so on the word of a possible ex-boyfriend. He had asked All Might to see if he could pull some strings, All Might was aware that Suijin knew everything. From when Izuku had met him on the beach to begin training almost a year ago. While the discussion was slightly heated, All Might knew there was no putting the genie back into the bottle. Izuku's passion for the girl and his intentions to marry her once he graduated sealed the deal for the pro. All Might had promised that he would see what he could do. The knock at his door snaps him out of his worries. When he opens the door, he is surprised to see Kobayashi standing there. He notices a woman with a frog quirk standing behind him. She seems pleasant, dressed in a simple classic suit. Slightly confused, he invites them in, heading to the kitchen to offer them a drink. 
As he returns with some bottles of water, he then notices that the woman is carrying a car seat. Looking at the occupant, he is sure that the child is an Ari. He recognizes her from all the pictures Suijin had sent. His knees wobble, and his voice cracks as he asks, What can I do for you today? Mr. Midoriya, you need to sit down and listen to what I am about to say, Kobayashi says gently but firmly. Izuku takes a seat as he notices the woman looking around the house, seemingly judging the state of the home. Izuku is about to say something when Kobayashi gets his attention. Mr. Midoriya, I need you to ignore Mrs. Asui for the next few minutes and focus on me. Can you do that? Same tone in his voice. Izuku, not trusting his voice, nods. Mr. Midoriya, I regret to inform you that there has been a terrible accident. Suijin Yamada has been killed. Izuku's mind immediately flashes to the unfinished bottle of booze. Not only does he think about it, but he also knows precisely where it is. He is in shock, his hand is trembling. No, no, this cannot be happening not again. His thoughts are interrupted by Kobayashi snapping his fingers to regain Izuku's attention. Mr. Midoriya, Suijin had given birth to a child about a year and a half ago on December 15th. Best day ever. Izuku's mind snaps to that strange text. We have run paternity in the child, in fact, yours, Mr. Midoriya. The woman brings the car seat cover so Izuku can look down at his daughter. Wrapped around the car seat handle like a charm is a gold necklace with a gold dolphin charm with aquamarine eyes. Izuku sees the chain and immediately goes to talk, only for his eyes to roll back into his head as he faints. Izuku's mind. What is going on? Oh, dear God, Suijin is dead, I have a daughter. It was Inari all along, why didn't she say something? It was the day I met All Might, that is what she needed to talk to me about. She was going to tell me that she was pregnant. She knew I would drop everything to be with her, she wanted me to follow my dream. She wanted me to go to UA, and become a hero. She hid this from me, we had a daughter. I have a daughter. How am I going to raise a kid? Why did they not take the child to her parents? If my name was on the birth record, is that why they brought her to me? Maybe her parents are out of town. Oh my god, they will come home to find their daughter dead and their grandchild missing. Why didn't her dad say something or her mom? Like a puzzle coming together it all fell into place. How she would gush about Anari and share everything with me makes sense now. She shared my daughter's life with me so I would know how she was doing. How could she lie to me all this time? What am I going to do? Shit. All might. What is he going to say? What is he going to do? Can I still be a hero? I have a daughter now, wait, should I have a daughter? If her parents don't take Inari, I may give her up for adoption. I know nothing about kids, I have never even held one before. I don't think I can do this. The darkness dissipates as purplish light emerges from the night, it starts to drift closer and closer to Izuku. As it gets closer, he realizes that in the center of the light is a person, a woman. With a final bright pulse, the light dissipated, and standing before him was the seventh bearer of one for all, Nana Shimura. Black hair, purple eyes, dark, sleeveless bodysuit with a high collar, yellow elbow-length gloves, white knee-high boot, and small white cape. He recognized her immediately from pictures he had seen. Nana, hey, kid, I know you are in a bad place, but I want you to listen to me. But how are you here? Is this real? Yes, this is real, that's the easy part. You are inside one for all right now, you are not alone here. All the previous bears are here as well. When you pass on, parts of yourself like an echo or a vestige of you are held inside one for all. Why didn't All Might tell me this? He doesn't know. We have never been able to talk to him like we are. I tried hard sometimes, but that big dummy never heard me. Or if I could get through to him it was while he was sleeping, he would dismiss it as a dream. So, how is this happening now? Well, after Yagi passed one for all onto you, we could tell something was different. Maybe it is because Yagi had one for all for so long, and it has accumulated so much power that it has changed. But we all knew we would be able to talk to you soon, but when all this happened, I knew I had to talk to you now. What is happening is too important, I just had to talk to you. Why do you need to talk to me now? Did you somehow know about Inari? No, I knew nothing about your daughter, I had suspicions though something was up, as sharing your mind, we know what is going on in your life. But that is not why I am here. I just need you to listen to me please. Nana said as she grabbed Izuku's hands. Izuku nodded. When I was alive, it was a lawless time. Being a hero was even more dangerous than it is today. There was an ancient villain, his name was All for One. He was the brother of the first bearer of One for All, and he is the reason One for All exists in the first place. All for One has been chasing down One for All for 150 years, trying to take it back, but he just can't. So, he hunts down the bearers and kills them in this vain pursuit. I was married and had a child when I inherited One for All, and when I found out that this big bad was coming for me, I was terrified. First One for All killed my husband, and in fear, I put my son up for adoption, thinking I was doing what was best for him by hiding him. I wasn't. I was afraid, and instead of trusting the people around me, I abandoned him. I made my decision out of fear, no good decision comes from that place. But if One for All is still out there, shouldn't I follow your lead? First, One for All is dead, Yagi killed him. That was the villain that injured him, it was All for One. If you let her go, you will regret it for the rest of your life, and she will never entirely understand either. Izuku, I will not sit here and lie to you and tell you it won't be challenging because it is the hardest thing you ever do. 
but it will also be the most rewarding, even if it is a simple smile or a laugh. If you walk this path, you will soon realize that you are not walking it for yourself anymore and will be walking it for her. It will be hard, and sometimes she will not understand your sacrifices, but hopefully, in the end, she will. In the end, you will. What if I am not ready? I know I am not ready, I don't want to fail her. No one ever is Izuku, and no parent is ever perfect. All you can do is when you have raised a child is hope to be better than your parents did. Doing better than your dad is a guaranteed win, but it will be hard to outdo your mom. It would be nice to try, though, wouldn't it? I don't know if I can. His body begins to shake as the tears that have just been below the surface begin to emerge. It all seems so impossible, I feel so broken. A hero's job is to figure out the impossible Izuku. Regardless of how long you are a hero, no situation is the same, no villain is the same, and every task will seem impossible. But it is our job to figure that out. It is okay to be broken, it is okay to collapse, but you smile. You smile for that little girl as if you are their world. You smile so everything will be okay. Then you cry for those lost, for the pain, and for the uncertainty. Smile for me once, and show me that everything will be alright, in Ko's final words echo in his mind. Izuku loses all sense of self-control and sobs. He feels Nana pull him in tight and hold him while he lets it flow. He doesn't know how long it lasts or how time would work within one for all. Nana releases him, I have faith in you, ninth. She says as she begins to drift and fade back into the darkness. Izuku sits there in the darkness. Can I do this? Should I do this? He thinks of Suijin, and his heart tightens. He then thinks of all the pictures, the joy in her voice whenever she would talk about Inari. Besides memories, all he has left of Suijin is Inari, all Inari has is him. He knows that he must find out about Suijin's parents and that he must tell All Might. He wants to be a hero, but Nana is correct. It is not for the same reasons as before, it's for his mom, Suijin, and Inari. He will become a hero that they can be proud of and the greatest hero this world has ever seen. With a shaky resolve, he begins to regain consciousness. The real world. As the world slowly came back into focus, Izuku's eyes fluttered open, taking in the house's ceiling, gingerly. He turned his head to see Kobayashi staring at him and Mrs. Asui doing the same. She had a neutral look on her face showing neither concern nor dismissiveness. How long was I out? He asked. Just a few minutes. Under the circumstances, it is understandable, so do not fret, Kobayashi replied helping Izuku to sit up slowly. Take your time, but there are some things that we need to address. Izuku took a few more minutes to make sure everything was clear, his mind focusing on what Nana had told him, the thought of his daughter. Aside from Suijin's parents, Suijin was gone, and Izuku was all the little girl had. It was unfair to think that he had to decide so soon that would affect his life and, more importantly, Inari's life. Aaron thoughts that Suijin may have been unfaithfully moved through his mind. Not only did he feel immediately guilty, but he also just as quickly immediately dismissed it. She loved him, and he was sure she had hidden the truth about Inari to allow him to follow his dream of being a pro hero. She had accepted the burden of being a single mother for him, doing her best to raise their daughter. Nana's words rang in his smile for you are her world. Pushing down his tears, he ensured his full attention was on Kobayashi. I am sure that you have questions, he said. Too many. First, tell me what happened to her. What of Suijin's parents? And is she mine? I can answer all that, but somewhat out of order, now, please focus on what I am to say. Izuku nodded for Kobayashi to proceed. Suijin's parents were the villains Water Dragon and Elementa. They had broken into a secure facility and stolen some sensitive information. I do not know what that information is. The villains retreated, unknowing that they were already being tracked by pursuing heroes. The heroes attacked the secluded home the villains were in. They did not thoroughly check the home and were unaware of Suijin's or Inari's presence. As the battle escalated, it threatened her and the child's life. In an attempt to calm the conflict and protect Inari, Suijin got in the middle of the fight and was unfortunately struck and grievously injured. Her parents immediately surrendered, and medical attention was sought for Suijin. Sadly, the help was too far away, and she succumbed to her injuries en route to the hospital. Before she passed, she named you as the little girl's father, and made the paramedic promise to make sure you received her necklace. According to the testimony, she was adamant about that and kept saying she was sorry for not telling you. Genetic testing was done at the hospital confirming that Inari is your daughter, at which time I was notified as I am your legal representative in all matters. Izuku, who had been on the verge as soon as the story started, began to cry softly, tears running down his cheeks. Kobayashi continued after handing over a linen handkerchief. Suijin's parents have been arrested and going to jail for a long time, even if not, raising Inari would be out of the question. You do have the right to give her up for adoption. You can also choose to take Inari in and raise her yourself. Should you choose to do so, Mrs. Asui has been assigned as your caseworker, she is with the Child Safety Division. She would have the final say on if it would be in Inari's best interest to stay with you or be placed in foster care. Izuku's mind was filled with a flurry of thoughts. Was he capable of handling this situation? Could he pull it off? What if All Might asked him to give up one for all? And how would he manage to balance being a hero and a teenage father? Suddenly, his inner turmoil was interrupted by the sound of a crying child. He watched as Mrs. Asui carefully lifted the child from the car seat and held her close, doing her best to calm her down. 
Then, as he caught a glimpse of the child's eyes, he saw a beautiful blend of his and Suijin's, a stunning teal color. He noticed strands of blue and green in the sunlight in her hair. This wasn't just any child but his daughter and Suijin's. At that moment, all his worries dissipated. He had to do right by her. His resolve became unbreakable, and he knew exactly what to do. Izuku looked at Kobayashi with no tears in his eyes, instead of fierce determination. I will take her, I want to raise her. Good, now Mrs. Asui is going to assess the house, after which she will have forms for you to sign and outline the program you must adhere to. I took the liberty of picking up some of the essentials that will see you through for now. I will inform you what needs to be adjusted with your stipend and the financial records. I will provide you a copy of all the information I need. Now, Mr. Midoriya, would you like to hold your daughter? Izuku nodded as the woman came over and guided him properly to hold Inari. For Izuku, it felt like they had handed him a bomb. Anyone who had a child knew it was a more accurate analogy than others would give it credit for. They left him there on the couch as Kobayashi went outside to bring in the items he mentioned, and Mrs. Asui went to perform her evaluation. Father and daughter meet for the first time. She gazed up at this new face yet familiar face before her. Why was it familiar, she didn't know. When this person whispered her name, she liked it. She was mesmerized by the new face taking it all in. Izuku was lost in a sea of teal, he felt himself melting. He knew he was sinking, then Inari wrapped her little hand around his finger, and it was all over. She had him hooked, wrapped around her finger, he knew he would move heaven and earth for her. He couldn't help but smile, and when he did, she smiled back and made noises at him. It was the most adorable thing he ever heard. They were lost in a little moment in time. Kobayashi watched silently, not wanting to ruin an obvious bonding moment. Though he had no children of his own, he was not immune to the cuteness of children. Watching the new father and his daughter stare at each other, he couldn't help but smile a little. He even looked to see Mrs. Asui admiring the situation. With a slight cough, she called their attention. Mrs. Asui told him that the house was adequate, but he would need to acquire many things. But for now, it was safe and clean enough for a start. She left him a detailed list of things he needed to acquire, should acquire, and areas that needed to be cleaned better. She deemed the supplies that Kobayashi brought to be a good start. She assisted him with Inari's first feeding, a diaper change, how to handle her, how to hold her, and how to take it when Inari would inevitably cry. The woman ran over a list of things for Izuku to do, pamphlets for him to read, and recommendations for support groups for single parents. She then sat down and detailed the program he would be entering to ensure he was fit for the new role. He had to sign some papers as she double-checked the list. She then stood. Now, Mr. Midoriya, the important thing is not to panic and avoid loud noises that will startle the child. I will be back tomorrow to perform a wellness check. I wish you the best of luck on your first night. If you have any questions, my number is at the bottom of my card. Good night, Mr. Midoriya. The woman bowed before excusing herself. I will be in touch as well, Mr. Midoriya. I hope to be here tomorrow to review everything we need to do to comply with the regulations. I am sorry for your loss. My heart goes out to you for enduring such heartbreak so soon. Kobayashi said with a bow before he left. It was just the two of them. It took Inari a bit to process that they were not returning. When this realization sank home, the experienced adults had left her in the presence of an amateur of the highest order, and Inari began to cry. Izuku was calm for a very long two seconds. Okay, he went over to the pamphlet that Mrs. Asui had left. He was glancing over the list. She wasn't hungry, didn't want a bottle, her diaper was exemplary, and swaddling didn't work. He placed her on his shoulder, trying to stay calm while looking at the diagrams in the pamphlet. He started gently patting her back and lightly rubbing it up and down. Hinari still cried, burped, and threw up on her dad. Suddenly everything seemed better. Fucking really. Izuku thought. Deep in his mind, Nana, who was watching, laughed, welcome to fatherhood, kid. The talk. After Izuku was able to settle Inari down, he started to think about his next step. He would need to go shopping for Inari, but he couldn't do that now. He would have to wait to talk to Kobayashi first. Izuku called Itsuka. He had to tell her what had happened to Suijin and about Inari. He left a voicemail telling her to call him day or night, which was incredibly important. Staring at the phone, he knew the conversation he needed to have. All Might looked at his ringing phone. Seeing his protege's name appear on the identification, he smiled, assuming that Izuku was calling to tell him about his final exams. Young Midoriya, did you receive your grades? I did, Mr. Yagi, I passed everything with an A, but that is not why I am calling you. I know this is sudden, but I need you to come to my home immediately, there have been some developments, and I need to talk to you in person. All Might could hear the unspoken plea in the boy's voice. In truth, he was about to depart to look for the boy's missing girlfriend, but something told him that his protege needed him. I will be there in about an hour, young Midoriya. Thank you, Izuku said, disconnecting the call. He took a deep breath, placing Inari in a high chair. He put some infant cereal on the tray to keep her occupied as he fixed himself a quick meal. It was distracting, to say the least, he kept looking over his shoulder, afraid that if he didn't, some catastrophe would befall his daughter or she might disappear. Having prepared a quick meal with some soft food to share, he sat and ate, taking joy when his daughter ate some of the food and hearing her smack the tray. It threw him for a loop, his daughter, his and Suijin's daughter. His mind went to what he had missed already in Inari's life and all that Suijin would forget. 
He managed to keep his emotions in check as he washed the dishes and wiped down the counters. Then there was a knock at the door that he stiffened, suspecting who was on the other side but afraid of what that would mean. Taking Inari into his arms, he opened it, seeing the smiling face of Mr. Yagi and watching as it morphed into confusion at the child in his protege's arms. All Might stepped into the house, removing his shoes. The silence was beginning to build. He sat in a chair opposite Izuku and the child, who took a seat on the couch. Um, young Midoriya, I didn't know that you had taken a job babysitting. Not exactly Yagi-san. He crossed the room, lifting Inari from the bassinet. All Might, this is my daughter Inari. Inari, this the All Might, the girl cooed. W-W-W-H-H-H-A-A-T-T-T-T-T. All Might yelled as the girl burst into tears. It took Midori a five minutes to calm Inari down while looking at All Might, who looked sheepish while he studied his protege and the child. Inari sat in her father's arms, sniffing as she finally settled down. I apologize for my outburst, young Midoriya, but I am sure you can explain. I can, and I will, he said. Midoriya then began to explain. He told All Might everything about how he and Suijin had sex before she left. She never told him that Inari was his daughter, she was just a kid that Suijin babysat for. Then about Kobayashi and Mrs. Hisui coming over today as he finished his school finals. He told him how Suijin was dead, her parents were villains, and how she got caught in the crossfire trying to stop the fight to protect Inari. He told him how he thought about adoption and how he had passed out. Meet Nana and what she had told him, and that he was going to keep Inari. However, he was terrified of failing his daughter, Suijin, his mother, and All Might himself. All Might was surprised when Izuku said that he would surrender one for all if All Might asked him. He was also reeling from the shock that somehow Izuku had talked to Nana and that she and the others somehow recited within one for all. It had to be true that All Might had never told Izuku about all for one. Izuku would understand if All Might were to ask, he would give up one for all. But he could not give up on Inari, he needed to be the best hero for his daughter and his mother and Suijin were watching him. All Might watched as the tears fell. He watched as Izuku tried to hide the emotion as he held his daughter. All Might took this all in. Could he do that to Midoriya? No Izuku. He had met with Night Eye's candidate, and Myra was undoubtedly on his way. He knew that in his heart, Izuku was the one. But now he had a child, All Might, of course, he had never had children. Not that he didn't like them, but he was always so busy being the symbol of peace. And here was the next symbol telling him he would give it up if asked, in the same breath telling him that this would drive him to new heights. Izuku had known so much pain. The abuse, his father's abandonment and death, his mother's death, and now Suijin. All Might closed his eyes in contemplation. He would have to talk to Nezu. There were dorms in the UA. Would a child be allowed? What about childcare? He saw the fire in Izuku's eyes when he talked about being a better hero. He believed it, and he felt it in his bones. He would have to speak to Torino about Nana giving her child up for adoption, but he knew he couldn't ask that of Izuku. All Might had denied himself a life out of fear of all for one. Nana had given up her child in fear of all for one. But he had defeated that bastard. It may be too late for All Might to have any of that. He couldn't take that from Izuku. Izuku could hardly breathe. It felt like hours as he waited for All Might to say anything. He couldn't look at his mentor, afraid of what would be displayed, instead. He focused on Inari, smiling at her and making faces, to which sometimes he was rewarded with giggles and smiles. Izuku, All Might said, finally breaking the silence. Izuku winced a little bit, expecting to receive bad news. After all, Mr. Yagi had never called him Izuku. It was always young Midoriya. I will not ask you to give up one for all. We will have to talk to Nezu about this situation. But I want you to know you are not alone, Izuku. I will help you through this the best I can. I may not know much about children, but I have the financial resources to ensure you are stable and Inari will want for nothing. Think. He was cut off when All Might raised his hand, signaling he was not done. But I am not going to let up on your training while. I am very pleased that you can manage 20%, but if you cannot manage 30% by the time of the entrance exam, we will have to revisit this topic. I know it may seem harsh or unfair, but I need to know that even with your new circumstances that you are still dedicated to taking over as the next symbol of peace. I don't think it is harsh, Mr. Yagi, I need to prove that I can do this and manage to be a father. If I can't complete this task, how can I continue to grow once I have entered UA? He managed. Izuku looked down at Inari's smiling face. I know I have already asked a lot tonight, but can I ask a favor? You are raising an eyebrow. Of course, you can always ask, the worst anyone can tell you is no. But you will never know unless you ask. If something happens to me, can you please ensure Inari is, okay. All Might was touched. Of course, Izuku, of course. I swear to you that if something were to happen to you, Inari would be well taken care of. Thank you, All Might. I am sorry, but I am going to have to skip training tomorrow, I'm sorry. I have to meet with Kobayashi to review any changes to my finances, and I have a list of things I need to buy before I meet with Mrs. Asui. That is completely understandable. Would you be available around 4 tomorrow to talk to Nezu? We need to see if you are. Has a childcare system in place and what is the option for living arrangements at the school? After all, it is a dorm system. I believe so. If anything changes, I will let you know immediately. Excellent now. Do you have a car seat? 
Izuku nodded, pointing to one in the corner. Would you also consider teaching me how to drive, as it seems I will need that ability sooner rather than later? Izuku asked. His attention was momentarily distracted by the cutest yawn ever. Izuku smiled at his little girl, placing her against his shoulder and gently patting her back. I would be honored as soon as you obtain your permit, All Might said. Excuse me for a moment. Let me put her to bed. Izuku stood up, walking Inari down the hall to where the bassinet had been set up in his room. He exited, leaving the door cracked, before returning to the living room. All Might stood up. Is there anything else you need? Izuku stopped, walked over, and stood before All Might. It's okay now to cry, right? Nana said I could cry when it was at night. All Might stepped forward, wrapping his arms around the young man. Yes, Izuku, it is okay to cry now. It was a torrent of emotions from the day, it was all so much. News of Suijin's death, Inari being his daughter, talking with Nana, agreeing to be a single father, All Might still believing in him. It was a lot for one day. It's okay, Izuku. Call Toshi from now on. Thank you, Toshi. Is this what it is like to have a father? Izuku thought. All Might left shortly after. Izuku made his way back to the couch and sat there numbly, emotionally exhausted, physically exhausted. It was just a numbing sensation that took over his body as he sat there in silence. He didn't even realize that he had fallen asleep sitting up. He was startled awake by his phone ringing. He needed to figure out the time. He saw it was Itsuka. His heart fell into his stomach. Hi, Itsu, he said, at any other time in his life, he would be overjoyed to hear from his best friend. Itsuka knew something was wrong, his voice told her something terrible had happened. Oh god, Izuku no, no, no. Please tell me everything is, okay. I'm sorry, Itsu, I can't. That would be a lie. What's going on? Come on, I need you to answer me. Izuku took a deep breath. I'm sorry, Itsu, Suijin is dead. She was killed in the crossfire between some heroes and villains. He could hear her break, all he could hear was Itsuka sobbing on the other side of the line. Itsu, that's not all. Suijin had a daughter, our daughter. She never said anything to me. A daughter. It's Inari, isn't it? Yes, she is staying with me now. Itsu, I miss you so much right now. I know, Izu, I miss you too, I'm coming home, I promise. I will stay this time, you won't be alone. What about school or inheriting the dojo? I can transfer schools, some things are more important than a dojo like you and Inari. I will be there soon, I promise. I know this suck, but I have to go. I need to. I understand, Itsu, I can't wait to see you. Same. The line disconnected, leaving the silence again. He sat in the darkness for about an hour. He heard the alarm in his room go off. It was 5 a.m., and Ari started to cry immediately. Oh, for fuck's sake, I didn't even think of that. He ran down the hall to his daughter as he opened the door. It's okay, Inari, it's okay, why? Because I am here. Daddy is right here. Izuku. The first morning went downhill after the 5 a.m. alarm incident. It wasn't that bad, it was more that it was new. Having to get Inari changed, dressed, and fed while trying to figure out how to do so himself was a unique experience and one that Izuku was struggling with. Still new to diaper changing and Izuku being well himself, Izuku's process took much longer than it should have as he read the pamphlet and checked his work. Inari tolerated this in the beginning, but then she started to get cold due to her state of undress, this prompted her to cry. This flustered Izuku to think he had messed up, this, of course, caused him to start the process over as he was unsure where he made a mistake. Inari's frustrations increased, and she knew she wanted mama. So, she said so, and between cries came the little voice and word mama. Izuku would instead have simultaneously taken full power attacks from All Might and Gran Torino than hear that. His mind was immediately filled with Suijin and her permanent absence from their lives. Izuku fought back his tears, enough to get the job done, after he wrapped Inari in a blanket and held her, the little girl began to calm some, but she repeated her call. Izuku could have been imagining things, but each time he heard Inari say it, he swore there was an increased tone of desperation. Verbal daggers drove through his heart with every call, he just held on to Inari, whispering any words of comfort that sprung to his mind, Inari didn't understand any of this but felt safe in this person's arms. As that feeling permeated through her, she began to calm down. After the new family calmed down, Izuku got her dressed in one of the outfits that were brought over. The struggle was the socks and shoes, which Inari did not like. A breakfast of scrambled eggs, baby cereal, and milk was presented to the little girl. After what seemed to Izuku as judgmental taste tests, she deemed the offering worthy and began to eat. He noticed his daughter perked up when he presented her with bananas and sliced grapes. He sat and smiled as she would grab her little plastic utensils and bring the food to her mouth, dropping most of it back to the plate, but the supreme look of satisfaction for what food she did manage kept on the fork. At promptly 7 a.m., he received a message from Kobayashi that he would be coming by soon so they could go over paperwork as they had a full day ahead of them. Izuku had time to clean up the kitchen before Kobayashi arrived. As the lawyer looked around, he seemed pleased that Inari was dressed and seemingly fed. He waited for Izuku to sit before he set his briefcase on the coffee table, opening it. He began to remove several packets. Izuku listened attentively as the first thing Kobayashi wanted to discuss was Izuku legally recognizing Inari as his daughter and all that it involved. While this was the most lawfully dense of the paperwork they would be going through this day, it was also the easiest, many signatures and stamps. Next, Kobayashi offered a polite smile. 
I understand the sensitive nature of what we are about to discuss. If at any point you need to take a break, simply do so, as we are not against a hard time limit. He waited for Izuku to nod before continuing, with Suijin's parents incarcerated, the responsibility of her funeral falls to you. I understand, I would like to have the same services that were performed for my mom performed for Suijin. How will this cost effect? Before he could continue, Kobayashi politely interrupted. The Hero Commission will cover all the expenses for the funeral. There has also been a large, sizable donation made that will more than cover all of Inari's initial expenses. Sound a lot like blood money, Izuku said. Do we need it? Need no, but it would allow a much easier start without jeopardizing future holdings. Also, as Inari's now sole legal guardian, you can seek financial restitution for the incident on Inari's behalf. Will that allow me to know the heroes' names? Not likely, we can ask, but they will deny us. What seeking restitution will do is provide a sizable payout that we can use to help ensure Inari's future. It will also mean that should any mental trauma arise for her later, it will be fully paid for by the Hero Commission. I still don't like financially benefiting from Suijin's death. Understandable, but if you like, we can put the payout in a special account just for Inari to access in the future. Also, if you are still going to pursue a future in heroics, the better financial situation you can leave her in. Izuku thought about it, no one planned to die anytime soon, but his life proved that death didn't care for your plans. Okay, I think I can live with that. Can we do a 9 to minus 10 split? With only 10% of the payout going to my current finances, the rest to her future fund. Yes, that is well within the amount you can legally claim. If you want, I can make sure to begin an investment portfolio for her along the lines of the same one I have for you. As long as we are not invested in everything together, and the appropriate amount of risk is kept in mind, I don't have a problem with that, Izuku said, and Inari started to wage battle against her shoes again. Then I would like to simply arrange a simple service along the lines of my mother's and have her laid to rest in my family's plot. How soon can we draft up a will? Kobayashi pulled out another packet. I already drew one up last night, I have Inari named as your sole beneficiary, you just need to name an executor and guardian. If possible, sir, I would like to retain your services for that, Izuku said. I would be honored, Kobayashi replied with a slight bow, her guardian. Tashinori Yagi and Itsuka Kendo, but I must discuss that with her. I am sure she will say yes, but I want to double check. But Tashinori Yagi has already agreed. Excellent, we will just need him to sign the paperwork. Once I get all this information added, I will provide you with a copy for him to sign. And when you talk to Ms. Kendo, we can do the same. Izuku attention was called to Inari as she made a triumphant yell as her right shoe was now on the floor. When Izuku picked up the shoe and put it back on her foot, she pouted at him as if saying, Do you know how long it took me to get that off? Kobayashi smiled at the little girl's reaction before looking at Izuku. Is anyone else you need to notify of Suijin's passing? Sadly no, there will likely be less than 15 people for the service. We can have the after-gathering catered since the Hero Commission is paying. Izuku said, I want the rest of Inari's and Suijin's belongings and personal effects. It is already on its way. It should be here in a few days. Now we must go shopping for the little lady, as Mrs. Asui will be here tomorrow and want to know our progress. They left home and went shopping, discussing many things. Izuku had arranged to have his mother's room cleaned and some of the stuff placed in storage. He wanted to keep the furniture but wanted to replace the mattress. He would remove everything from his room and wanted to turn that into Inari's room entirely. The house had a third room converted into an office and spare bedroom, Izuku decided to leave it that way. So, movers and painters were going to be needed. As Izuku walked around the streets with a small child and an older man, he noticed the strange looks of passersby and shop staff at the baby store where they purchased furniture. Despite feeling overwhelmed by the items needed and their cost, Kobayashi reassured him that the donation covered everything. They even arranged for delivery of the more oversized items. They bought clothes, toys, and children's videos at the next store. Izuku was impressed by Kobayashi's knowledge of child rearing, and during lunch, he learned about safe foods for Inari to eat. They even visited a bookstore where Izuku picked up parenting and picture books. They made it home, and Kobayashi helped him inside and even told him that he would watch Inari while he bathed. Izuku was thankful and did precisely that. When he came out, he quickly dressed and found Inari asleep in her new playpen while Kobayashi ended his phone call. I believe we have made as much progress on my end as we can today, I will be in touch with the painters and movers tomorrow. Please begin to sort the items you wish to keep or put in storage, I will find a proper facility for your needs. If you need anything, I am always available at any time. Kobayashi said with a bow. Thank you, Kobayashi. No thanks are needed, Izuku. With that, he took his leave. Izuku took advantage of the moment to decide which items he wanted to keep or sell from his mother's room. His one-half-year-old daughter Inari slept peacefully, giving him more time to sort things out. During her waking hours, Izuku cradled her and strengthened their bond. When All Might arrived, he was seated in the living room, browsing the requirements for obtaining a license. He opened the door, telling All Might that he needed to get the diaper bag ready and that he would be prepared to depart. Izuku just enjoying the ride talking with All Might. No, he was talking with Toshi as they drove. All Might was the number one hero, this was the man that had not only changed Izuku's life, but he was also the man that was standing behind Izuku and giving him support. 
Is this what it is like to have a father? Meeting the principal, as Izuku sat in the car, he couldn't help but admire the joy on Anari's face. She seemed entirely mesmerized by their surroundings, and he couldn't blame her. He wondered if all she could see were the changing lights. Eventually, they arrived at a private parking area and were led to a private elevator by Toshi. Once they reached their destination, they were politely greeted and shown to a luxurious office. Izuku sat in one of the leather chairs facing the large oak desk while Inari sat in her car seat beside him. As the chair turned around, they were greeted by a white rodent-like creature. Am I bear? Am I a mouse? Neither am the principal of UA. Izuku raised an eyebrow. Hearing a giggle from his side, he looked down at Inari. When he looked back, the principal was gone. He listened to the laughter again and looked to his side. He saw the principal beside him looking down at Inari, who was giggling up a storm reaching out for the principal. Much to Izuku's surprise, the principal looked down and extended his paw, which Inari grabbed onto and started laughing. What an adorable child, was all he said. Toshi cleared his throat. Um, sir, you know why we are here, I am sure that Izu. I mean, young Midoriya would like to begin this meeting. Also, as I am sure you have surmised, young Midoriya, the principal, is aware of everything regarding one for all. Yes, let us begin, Nezu said as he freed his paw from Inari, much to the girl's dismay. Izuku distracted the girl by slipping a rattle into her hand as Nezu leaped on the desk and sat facing them. The principal crossed his legs staring intently at Izuku. Mr. Midoriya, start at the beginning and don't leave anything out. Izuku took a deep breath and told his story. That is quite the tale, Mr. Midoriya. I am sorry that one so young has experienced so much loss. He turned his attention to All Might and what have you decided All Might? Yesterday, young Midoriya contacted me and shared his strong convictions and dedication towards his newly acquired daughter. Despite a slight shift in his motivation, he remains committed to becoming a hero. I stand by my decision and have conveyed my expectations for the upcoming year before his entrance exam. While there may be some initial hurdles, I believe in his abilities and potential. Internally, Izuku wanted to cry some. The way Toshi spoke was more like a father than a mentor. He could feel the warmth and passion in his voice. At our university, we have faced unforeseen consequences from romantic encounters. However, this time, there is no parental or grandparental support available. The mother's parents are absent due to their villainous actions, possibly for the rest of their lives. We have a daycare facility on campus, but it is not free. Additionally, due to this unique situation, Mr. Midoriya, some conditions must be met before I allow you to take the entrance exam. Izuku looked up at Nezu. I understand, sir. Would you please elaborate? Absolutely. Firstly, we will thoroughly review the report from your case worker, Mrs. Asui, who will also provide input on whether you can take the exam. Secondly, you must fulfill all the requirements outlined by All Might. Lastly, it is essential that you demonstrate financial responsibility to support your child while pursuing your studies. I suggest seeking employment to prove your ability to juggle your training and parental duties, as this will be a practical test of your preparedness to handle the responsibilities of being a student and a father. As you may already be aware, a dorm system is in place. If you are interested, there is a potential opportunity for you to become a dorm caretaker, which would involve meal preparation and building oversight. This would provide you with the necessary funds. Additionally, we could offer better accommodations for your unique needs. I suggest applying as soon as possible. An evil grin passed over the principal that made All Might shudder. That sounds like a great idea. Working here for a year would enable you to enroll your child in the daycare for free and receive training from All Might with my supervision. However, there is a fourth condition. You must attend weekly counseling sessions with Hound Dog for your mental health and grief counseling. Depending on his evaluation, it could affect your ability to take the test or continue your employment. What are your thoughts on this proposal? All Might suspected Nezu had a plan when he offered the caretaker position at the dorms, which had never existed before. However, All Might needed clarification on what Nezu had in store. He couldn't advise Izuku to turn down such a great opportunity despite his doubts. As a UA employee, Izuku would receive additional health coverage for Inari and have the financial means to support his family. All Might was willing to provide financial assistance, but he knew Izuku would feel uncomfortable accepting it. Furthermore, the position would offer Izuku the support he needed during his studies, including a safe training environment and counseling. All Might placed his hand on Izuku's shoulder as the boy considered the offer. Izuku, this offer holds tremendous potential to assist you in your current situation. I encourage you to consider it carefully on your own. Additionally, please rest assured that I am prepared to offer you and Inari any necessary financial support should you require it. I urge you not to base your decision solely on financial considerations. This is good, too good. I should ask for a contract to be drawn up and have Kobayashi look it over. Izuku thought. Izuku knew it was a fantastic offer that would help to solve many of his problems, it was more than he could ask for. I agree as well, but I would like to have all this in writing so I can have my lawyer look it over before we formally agree, Izuku responded. Nezu smiled. I completely agree, Mr. Midoriya. I will finalize the document and send it to you tomorrow morning. He hopped off the desk and shook both their hand before turning his attention to Inari. I will see you soon, bright eyes. Inari let loose a torrent of giggles and babbled again. The drive home was silent as the car's rocking motion caused Inari to drift back to sleep. 
Once they arrived at Izuku's home, Izuku carried Inari quietly to her room. He turned on the newly acquired baby monitor and returned to the living room with Toshi. So, what do you think? He asked his mentor. I have a feeling that Nezu may have some ulterior motive. However, the offer in the city is unbeatable. It has the potential to resolve many issues. Let your lawyer review everything, and we can skip physical training for a few weeks, he said, raising his hand to prevent Izuku from objecting. Izuku, settling down with Inari is crucial, and there's also the funeral to attend. Skipping training won't harm the plan. It's essential to set everything up accurately. I want you to succeed. He stood up, gave Izuku a reassuring pat on the shoulder, and left. Izuku sat there in silence for a moment before slipping off into dreamland. Flashback. Izuku sat down on the couch next to Suijin, handing her the popcorn as he got comfortable, a soft smile on his lips as she snuggled beside him. What is this movie? An absolute classic. Trust me, darling, you will love it, she replied, hitting play on the remote. The Princess Bride. SHH. I never knew that about Sicilians. He whispered. Now you do. It may save your life one day, future hero. Ruse. Yes. He asked. I don't believe in them. I am not a witch. I'm your wife, she said, stealing the last popcorn. Have fun storming the castle, Izuku yelled at the screen. Now tell me that movie wasn't great, I dare you, she said, sitting up. For being as old as it is, I enjoyed it. It is so quotable. He responded, getting up. Will you grab me another soda while you're up? Izuku looked over his shoulder at her, as you wish. Flashback ends. The sound of Inari crying erupted from the monitor stirring Izuku awake. He wiped the dampness from his cheeks and hurried down the hall. It's okay, princess, daddy is here. Mrs. Asui. It was yet another exhausting day for her at the child safety system. She had to deal with paperwork and work long hours. After finishing her work, she still had to enter her notes for the day's visit. When she returned home, she realized her husband had yet to arrive. They both worked in the same department, and she knew he was investigating some severe neglect cases at an orphanage. Such cases tend to get complicated, and the system is often overwhelmed. The attacks by villains have left many children without a safe place to go. Parents often abandon children with unwanted quirks by dropping them off and disappearing. Despite her best efforts, there are too many cases and insufficient resources to help them. Her job is challenging and can be very demoralizing, with victories being rare. However, she remains hopeful that the most recent case she is working on will succeed. Despite the initial promise, she knows that appearances can be deceiving. Taking a deep breath, she steps out of the car, ready to face whatever challenges lie ahead. Upon opening the door, a chorus of mom, mommy, and mother greeted her as her two youngest children ran up and embraced her. This heartwarming moment was the highlight of her day and brought a sense of peace. Satsuki and Samadar, her youngest children, were excitedly sharing stories about their day and visiting the park, talking over each other. Biru attentively listened to their accounts and asked them essential questions before instructing them to wash up for dinner. She then proceeded to the kitchen, where her eldest child was cooking. Hello Tsuyu, how was your day at school? Her daughter turned and placed her finger near her mouth. Hiro, good Kayoka stabbed a boy in the ears today. Why did she do that this time? She said he was making a rude comment under his breath. You know, the usual. But school is good. I need to study for my math test after dinner. Oh, are you working on SETI? Yes, I have a home visit in the morning, but I think it will be brief. Why? I wanted to go to Kayoka's house so we could study history and English. Sounds great. I'll call you once I'm on my way home, and you can leave at that time. Kiro, thanks mom, Kiro. Here is your dinner. Oh, spaghetti. Yes, the sauce was on sale. Thank you, Tsuyu. Hey Tsuyu. Yes, mom. Is there a boy you like at school? Kiro. Tsuyu tilted her head sideways, thinking. No, not really, there are a couple I think are cute, but that's it. Why? Well, if you do. I want you to promise that if you ever get a boyfriend, make sure you are safe. I don't want you to have any tadpoles just yet. Sui was perplexed. Although she knew that it could happen at some point in the future, she had recently begun taking birth control to regulate her cycle for UA, as recommended in the information packet. Additionally, she had not encountered any boy that sparked her interest. However, upon further reflection, she concluded that the situation might be linked to a specific case. Does this have something to do with your case, Kiro? Yes, this boy is about your age. His girlfriend got pregnant from a night of passion before she moved and never told him. I had to deliver his daughter and watch him receive the news that the mother was dead. Watching the emotional roller coaster he had to endure was difficult. Today was the first follow-up. He seemed committed to meeting my goals and listened attentively when I talked. I hope he makes it. What about the mom's parents or his? The mothers are unavailable and he is dead. Oh, that's sad. Tiro, how do you think he is going to do? I think he has good potential, but we will see. Many cases like this start good, but then it all crashes down as the difficulty of the situation becomes overwhelming. Like you, he aspires to attend UA. S. Hero Course. I received word from the school that part of his potential enrollment will hinder my report. He wants to go to UA. With a kid. Is that even possible? They have some systems in place. It's a university to you. Nights of passion happen. That is why I want you to be prepared. In case you meet a special someone. I'm going to miss you, baby. Mother, I will miss you as well. 
I can file for an exemption to avoid living in the dorms. This way, I can still care for Satsuki and Samadair while fulfilling my responsibilities to my siblings. Her daughter's offer deeply moved Baru. She got up from her seat and walked towards her, embracing her tightly. No, Tsuyu, you've already sacrificed so much. It would be best if you didn't give up on anything else. Besides, it seems your dad will get that promotion, so he won't have to work late nights anymore. I want you to enjoy your college life to the fullest. Just promise me you'll call and come home now and then. I will, Mom, I love you. I love you too. Itsuka Kendo. When Itsuka was 12, she was training in the family dojo when her father called for her. She quickly rushed over, and there she was introduced to this skinny boy with messy curly green hair and diamond-shaped freckles. Yes, sensei, she said as she came to stand next to her father. Itsuka, this is Izuku Midoriya. He will be joining our dojo starting today. Please get him situated and then get him working. He will be your responsibility, not only for combat training but weight training as well, for as long as he is with us. Internally she scowled at the thought, why was her dad doing this? This kid wouldn't last, and to make him her responsibility would take her away from her training. Then her father's last sentence passed through her mind, as long as he is with us. Yes, S-E-N-S-E-I. She motioned for the kid to follow her, she led him to the locker room and told him to change. She noticed that when he responded to her, his voice was quiet, and yet he had a look of determination in his eyes. Dismissing any thoughts of sympathy from her mind, she ran him ragged when he emerged. She couldn't spar with them yet, so she had him lift weights, run, and start on the beginnings of his form and throw punches. Itsuka was not proud to say that she ran the boy ragged and was correcting him harshly. When she told him to be back tomorrow, she expected him not to show back up. Much to her surprise, he did. He came back every day for training. Whenever he got knocked down, she could see that determination in his eyes as he got back up. He never complained or whined about anything. In the second week, he threw a sidekick properly, and she praised him slightly. One would have thought she had bestowed a national medal. His smile was large and brilliant. Itsuka admitted that he was tough, and the more she watched and trained him, the more he grew on her. She soon softened her methods as she noticed the signs of bullying. She could tell that it was still going on, as he would sometimes come in with bruises that did not result from training. As they talked more, she saw him smile, lighting up the room, and Itsuka liked it when he smiled. Over a few months, they started to become more friendly. He had helped her with a math test allowing them to spend some time outside of training. When he explained the problem, Itsuka stared at his face, absently twirling her hair. She realized she had a crush on him. She was stunned, she didn't understand it. He was cute, yes, but she couldn't place her finger on it. Maybe he never gave up an attitude or the determination in his eyes whenever they trained, but the truth was in his smile. She said she was shocked and jealous when she found out he had a girlfriend. She began to hope that she was no good for him secretly, it was mean and petty of her. She knew that, but her heart would flutter so much when he would smile or laugh that she couldn't help it. Then came the day his girlfriend was coming to the dojo to watch a sparring tournament. Itsuka watched them from the other side of the dojo, and even from that distance, she could tell the girl cared. During Izuku's match, she saw her cheer when Izuku landed a strike and fret when he took one. Izuku brought her over right after it concluded to introduce them before he ran off to get changed. Suwaj and Yamada, it is a pleasure to meet you. Izuku won't stop talking about you, the girl said, extending her hand. Itsuka didn't want to like her, but she seemed so genuine. Itsuka Kendo, nice to meet you as well. Does he talk about me? Sensei this and sensei that. At first, I was kind of jealous, especially when I found out you were a girl. Do you still feel that way? Truthfully, a little bit, yay, Suwajin said, not breaking eye contact with Itsuka. But I can tell you care about him in his training. You seem pretty cool. Thank you, he works hard. But tell me, is he being bullied? You could tell. I have my suspicions, bruises that should be there, his actions, things like that. Yay, he is, but he wants to get stronger to stand up for himself and me. I tell him I can care for myself, but you know how boys can be. But he doesn't want to do it because he feels I am weak. After all, he cares. Don't tell him I told you, though. It will be our secret, Itsuka said with a wink. So, what are your guys' plans after? We are going to that new pizza place that just opened. Oh, Joey's. Yay, that's the place. Have you been? No, not yet, but I want to try it one day. Why don't you come with us? I wouldn't want to intrude on your guy's date or anything. Nonsense. Besides, I would like to get to know you better after all your training. Izuku, and you seem badass if I do say so, you kicked that guy but in the match. Itsuka rubbed the back of her head sheepishly. She didn't want to intrude, but she wanted to get to know Izuku's girlfriend better to ensure she was good for him. Well, if you are sure it won't bother me, I would love to go. Let me go get changed. That was how it started, pizza and soda. Soon, Suijin would come around the dojo more, even taking some classes herself. As much as Itsuka had hoped the girl was no good, she was wrong. Suijin was funny and caring and had an air that livened things up. Itsuka and Suijin started to become friends, so Itsuka decided to push her feelings for Izuku down. She rationalized it, it is just a crush that all, it will go away. I would rather have two friends than ruin everything. 
By the end of the year, she could safely say they were both her best friends. As the calendar turned and time marched on, they were inseparable, the three amigos. They did everything together, shrine visits, teasing Izuku, shopping trips, dinners, and even picnics. As much as Itsuka had tried to bury her feelings, they would resurface from time to time, like when Izuku would get flustered when the girls teased him or when he would start muttering about a quirk or a new hero. She did her best to ignore it. Suijin was her best friend, and Itsuka was not about to betray her best friend for a boy, even one as sweet as Izuku. It was a beach trip that almost betrayed Itsuka. She had gone out to pick up a new swimsuit as she had outgrown her last one, which had turned into a two-hour affair. After purchasing, she couldn't decide and went home to prepare for their trip. The train ride there was excellent as they chatted. She nervously went to get changed once they arrived. She happened to come out before Suijin saw Izuku standing there with his shirt off. Her eyes wandered over his bare chest. He wasn't a toothpick anymore, the workouts were showing fruits. She walked up and asked how she looked, uncertain of his response but secretly hoping for a specific answer. Her heart skipped a beat when he complimented her appearance, describing her as pretty and cute. She felt horrible, she had tried to push it down and not be that girl. Yet here she was, fretting over her swimsuit purchase, asking him what he thought and getting all fluttered when he said what she wanted. She felt sick, she felt like trash. Suijin was her friend, had been everything Itsuka could have asked for in a friend, and she was pinning for Izuku. She got up and went for a walk down the beach to buy a drink. When she stepped out of the little shop, she found Suijin waiting. Everything okay, Itsuka? Yay, Suijin, I just think I got a little overheated, so I grabbed a sports drink. Okay, wait for me. I wanted to grab something quick, Suijin said, disappearing into the store. Itsuka had lied. She felt terrible. Maybe she shouldn't hang out with them anymore. Just stick to training Izuku at the dojo. She knew Suijin might figure it out, but she could almost see Izuku's eyes confused and hurt. When Suijin emerged, she smiled, and the two girls started heading back. They had nearly made it back to where Izuku was when they heard it. Hey, ladies, what are you doing out here all alone? The girls glanced over and saw two guys a few years older than them looking at them, which made their skin crawl. They just kept walking when the other got in front of them. Hey, we are just trying to be friendly. Yay, we are friendly. We want to talk, said Tweedledee. Yay, talk, added Tweedledum. Tweedledee went to grab Suijin by the shoulder when Izuku suddenly appeared and grabbed Dee's wrist. Back off. He said, putting himself between the girls and the two jerks. Who the fuck are you, little man? This is my girlfriend and best friend, and they don't seem to want to talk to you, so why don't you combine your singular IQ? Points, take a hint, and leave. Oh, trying to act like a big man, huh? Let me show you what happens when you mess with us, Dum said, throwing a clumsy punch which Izuku easily deflected, having the girls move back as he did. It was Dee's turn to attack as he threw an overhand right that Izuku ducked under, driving his fist into Dee's stomach, then shoving him back. Dum threw another punch that Izuku could avoid, then grabbed the extended limb, he did a perfect throw driving the guy into the sand. Unfortunately, Dee recovered and landed a punch to the side of Izuku's head, causing him to stumble. Suijin was furious and about to jump in when Itsuka touched her shoulder, stopping her. Itsuka recognized the look in Izuku's eyes, the determination, the never-give-up attitude on his face. She knew this was him stepping up not only for them but for himself, that this was him standing up to bullying and finding the strength in himself to defend those he cared about. Itsuka didn't want to rob him of that, she knew Suijin could handle herself, and Itsuka had years of training, but this was from something more than driving off some jerks. This was Izuku confronting his past and standing up to it. It wasn't some epic battle Tweedledee and Tweedledum were not trained at all and didn't seem to know how to fight. More numbers caused them to land some shots on Izuku, but they stood their ground and eventually dropped D for the count, Dum was bleeding before he called it quits. Izuku blushed as Suijin overly fussed over him and told him she was proud of him for standing up for them. Itsuka smiled and said that he even managed to look cool at times. He smiled at her with a big grin, making her heart beat a little faster. They managed to enjoy a few more hours at the beach before they boarded the train. Itsuka gave the couple a little privacy. She caught a glimpse of Suijin and him wrapped in a passionate kiss. The girls teased him as they rode the train home. Itsuka got off at her stop. As she exited, she looked back, clasping her hand in front of her in a voice dripping with fake sincerity. I will be sure to tell father how you defended my honor, Izuku. By T.S.U.K.A. Izuku cried out at the doors close, he could hear her laughing, causing him to flush even more. Her father, of course, ribbed Izuku for a few weeks after the incident, but it was all good fun. Eventually, Izuku would smile about it and laugh. Itsuka was doing her best to wage a battle with her heart that she had deluded herself into thinking she was winning a bit. It wasn't since they had gone to compete in a tournament that her delusions would come crashing down. Suijin wasn't there as it was a weekend event leaving the two of them to hang out when they weren't competing. For Itsuka, it was nice, but I began to feed into her fantasies and daydreams. He had made it to the semifinals but was tired from the tournament and other activities. They may have stood up late watching some movies the night before. He was sitting in the locker room, his head dipping. She had sat next to him, noticing that he was about to fall over, she gently guided his head down to her lap. He protested weakly as she shushed him and told him to take a quick nap and that she would wake him when it was his time to compete. 
He immediately began to drift off. She began to run her fingers through his hair lightly. She heard him mutter something about it feeling nice before his eyes closed and his breathing steadied. As Itsuka could gaze down at him, his eyes closed, his soft breath. She felt her heart thumping. She thought I would wake him because it was so loud. Then she found herself thinking of kissing him. She even found herself leaning down before she stopped herself. This wasn't just a crush, she was in love with Izuku. Fuck, 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 she thought to herself. How could this happen? It was supposed to go away, not become this. I can't do this to Suijin or Izuku. Her mind raced at how Izuku had always treated her like a girl, never telling her she was unattractive or making fun of her for her tomboyish attitude. He admired her quirk praising it and going into muttering storms about it. He wasn't put off by her dream of being a pro hero, he shared it. She knew it was terrible, she longed to kiss, confess, and tell him. It was wrong. She knew it, so she did nothing. She just sat there, and her only fault was giving into the fantasy in her mind. Letting it play and dance the whole time was excellent, it was safe. The guilt tore at her over the following weeks, whenever she saw Suijin, it was worse. She began to put up walls between them, trying to force distance. She could see this confused and hurt Izuku, but she had to do it. Teacher and student, that was what Itsuka was trying to enforce. Itsuka was sitting in the living room watching something she couldn't even remember when the doorbell rang, she walked over and opened it, curious about who it could be. Her heart dropped when standing there was Suijin. Look, we need to talk, Suijin said, stepping inside and slipping off her shoes. Itsuka tried to make excuses until Suijin grabbed her by the hand and led Itsuka up to her bedroom. Suijin closed the door before whirling around to face the still-stunned redhead. You will tell me what is happening, or I am not leaving, Suijin said. Suijin, just please leave, Itsuka begged, part of her wanted to blurt it out and get it over with. Nope, you are my best friend, and I will not leave this alone. Those words tore at Itsuka's heart, no, Suijin, I am a terrible person. Itsuka couldn't say anything else, not trusting her voice. You're in love with Izuku, aren't you? Suijin said softly, breaking the silence. There it was, her secret right in the open, Suijin knew. At last, Itsuka could admit it, lose her best friend, and probably never see Izuku again. Yes, Suijin. Yes, I am. I thought it was just a stupid crush, but... Her voice broke from all the stress that only teenagers could put on themselves. Itsuka waited for Suijin to react or slap her or something. What she didn't expect was for Suijin to wrap her arms around Itsuka and say, I don't care, Itsuka, I trust you and Izuku. If you were a terrible person, you would have done something already. We can handle this together, you are our best friend. Izuku has been racking his brain, thinking he did something wrong. How can you not care? I just told you that I am in love with Izuku. Because you are my best friend, and you are his best friend. I am not willing to toss you aside just because of this. I know you aren't trying to steal him from me, and I know he isn't going to cheat, so this is less than ideal, but I am willing to deal with it to keep you in our lives. He needs you, and so do I. Itsuka didn't know what to say or do. She didn't want to lose him either. So, she sucked it up, hugging Suijin, and cried. Itsuka knew that there were more important things, and this was one of them. It was hard that she valued Suijin enough to hold on to her feeling and be the friend she needed to be, but she would make it work. Fortunately, they could make it work, though it still hurt Itsuka. So, when the opportunity came the following year for her to move with her grandfather to finish her training, she would have generally fought against it, instead, she took a chance to step away. She celebrates her 14th birthday with her best friends, as she will be leaving by the end of the school year. It was a tearful goodbye. Life on the mountain. Itsuka hated the first three months, there was no cell reception, so there was no way to text, group chat, internet, or one phone. Her grandfather did not like letting her spend the night talking to her friends. It sucked, but it allowed Itsuka to put some distance between them, she focused more on training and mastering her craft. The school was smaller than she had attended before but was still a decent size. She made a few friends, nothing like she had left, but it was lovely. Itsuka is trying to move beyond her feeling for Izuku. When Suijin also has to move, she does her best to be supportive. She is devastated when she learns of Inko's death and feels terrible that she can't support her best friend beyond random calls or being able to go to the funeral. She feels even more helpless when Izuku spirals into drinking. Itsuka struggles to reconcile her past with the new life she's trying to establish. Upon learning of Izuku's sobriety, she decides to move forward and explore the possibility of dating. At a tournament, she meets a boy named Shen who confesses his feelings for her. Itsuka accepts, and they go on a few dates, including her first kiss. Though the experience is pleasant, it fails to leave her feeling exhilarated. When discussing it with her mother, Itsuka struggles to come up with a more descriptive response than nice enough. They continue dating and kissing, but still, nothing seems to click. Itsuka's grandmother offers some advice, suggesting that perhaps Shen isn't the right person for her. Itsuka realizes that describing a kiss should evoke more than a nonchalant shrug and a lackluster response. It is easy to break it off with Shen making it even more apparent to Itsuka that it is the right choice. Also, the fact that he doesn't go to her school so they will not see each other daily makes it more accessible. 
He is sad but thankful that she was honest about things and wants to remain friends. Itsuka focuses on school and training. Everything will sort itself out when proper. When the school year changes again, she is moved to a different class where she meets Ajiro Masahiro and his friend Jirota Shishida. Ajiro is from a rival dojo. His quirk of the tail made any match they had more interesting, as she had to account for the extra appendage. Jirota has attended some classes at her grandfather's school. His intellectual nature seemed to class with his quirk of beast, but he was kind. She is glad she knows someone and joins them at lunch. They introduce her to a shy girl named Kanoko Komori, who is fascinated with mushrooms. It makes much sense when Itsuka learns that her quirk is called mushroom. The tentative friendship begins to solidify as they all wish to be heroes and attend UA. It isn't long before they are as thick as thieves, and Itsuka considers them all good friends. They may not be best friends yet, but it is nice to build her own life and expand her horizons. Itsuka is surprised when Ajiro confesses to her one day behind the school. The girl takes a moment to think before answering. She notices that the guy shares her passion for martial arts and aspires to become a hero. She also realizes he has much in common with her best friend. Despite this, she decides to take a chance and explore if there could be something more than friendship between them. Their first kiss was pleasant, although not as exciting as she had hoped it would be. She understands her unrealistic expectations and tries not to compare them to her imagined kiss with Izuku. Despite this, they continue to date. Ajiro. During a tournament, he was captivated by the appearance of Itsuka Kendo, her stunning orange-red hair, teal eyes, and figure. While they conversed briefly, he needed help to make any significant headway. When they encountered each other in school, the most he could manage was passing greetings in the corridors. He saw a chance he couldn't miss when she entered the classroom. Jirota teased his friend relentlessly about his crush, and when the girl appeared, he took it up a notch. Kinoka was the sensible one telling him to try and be friends with her first to see if they had things in common. Thankfully for Ajiro, he listened to his mushroom-loving friend, finding that friendship incredibly important to her, Itsuka. It was a topic of curiosity among them all regarding the person named Izuku, whom Itsuka often talked about through texts. Ajiro was anxious that Izuku might be Itsuka's boyfriend. Still, Kanoko cleared the air by revealing that Izuku was her best friend in a romantic relationship with Suijin, Itsuka's other closest friend. Jirota appeared skeptical about the specifics, but he chose to remain silent. Ajiro experienced a moment of great fear when he confessed his feelings to Itsuka. The situation was further complicated when she asked for time to consider it. Over the next few days, he felt anxious and unhappy. However, it all turned around when she finally agreed to date him, making it the happiest day of his life. Ajiro is concerned about finding the perfect birthday gift for his girlfriend, Itsuka. He overhears her mentioning that she needs new running shoes, which he believes would be an excellent present. However, Kanoko and Jiro advise him to choose a more romantic gift. Despite their advice, Ajiro remains determined to get her the shoes. After obtaining Itsuka's shoe size from Kanoko, he conducts thorough research to find the best possible pair. Despite his father's suggestions for alternative gifts, Ajiro sticks to his plan. The group goes out after school to have a small celebration for Itsuka, who is touched and thankful for the gesture. Kanoko gifts her friend some new ribbons for her hair, Jirota gets her a book on the history of martial arts in Japan, then Ajiro presented her with his gift. Itsuka. It was nice to have a small birthday celebration with her friends, it made her feel like a real high school student, and her boyfriend's presence made it pleasant. She wished that Suijin and Izuku could be there, but that was impossible. She had to admit that she was very curious about what Ajiro had gotten her. Their relationship was going well as far as she could tell, it still didn't move her into grand daydreams or flights of fantasies, but he had been in a few of her dreams which she took as a good sign. She constantly compared what she had seen from Suijin and Izuku, and her love life was not living up to. She would chastise herself for this and tell herself that she and Ajiro were moving at their own pace. The nagging thought was that she had said neither of them about Ajiro. With a wide grin, Ajiro passed the box to her, resembling a content cat. Upon unwrapping it, she discovered a top-of-the-line pair of running shoes. Even though she required a new team, she had anticipated a more romantic or emotional present from her significant other on her birthday. Although slightly let down, she smiled to mask her perplexity. She yearned for a gift that demonstrated that he viewed her as a woman, not solely as an athlete. Thank you so much, Ajiro, I needed a new pair. She said, hugging him. She thanked the other two, and they enjoyed a small cake to cap the event. Itsuka excused herself afterward as she had to get home. As she walked home, she couldn't shake the feeling that she was being ungrateful for receiving such lovely shoes. Though she needed them, which was convenient, she knew it didn't justify acting like a child and pouting. After all, her friends weren't obligated to get her anything for her birthday, but they chose to do so out of kindness. As she entered her home, her grandmother called out from the kitchen, directing Itsuka's attention to two boxes on the counter. Curious, she approached the two boxes, one sent by Suijin and the other by Izuku. She smiled as she swiftly took hold of the packages and darted to her room. Upon opening Suijin's gift, she discovered a delightful summer dress, black in color with elegant teal accents that perfectly complemented her mesmerizing eyes. 
The box from Izuku, however, stirred her curiosity even more. As she slowly lifted the lid, her breath caught in wonder at the sight of the two exquisite teal crystal earrings nestled within. Holding them up to the light, they glistened and sparkled beautifully. Her gaze then fell upon a folded note tucked beneath the box. Itsuka, I saw these and thought of you. I want you to know that I miss you every day and thank you for standing by me. It means more than you know. Happy birthday, Izuku. Itsuka quickly put them on and stood in front of the mirror admiring how beautiful they were. It made her heart race, and she felt like a girl. I can't wait to show them off tomorrow at school. Ajiro. He was sitting in class when his girlfriend walked in. It took him a moment, but then he noticed them. Those were new earrings dangling, beautiful teal crystal teardrops. He heard Kanoko inquire about them. Oh, these were waiting for me when I got home, Izuku sent them for my birthday. Suijin sent me a cute dress as well. Ajiro ground his teeth some, he knew this Izuku was her friend, but earrings like that were different. Chiroda noticed and silently agreed with his friend, he didn't know what this Izuku was playing at but didn't like it. There was a confident boy who bothered him because Itsuka would interrupt their interactions to answer a phone call or text message. He noticed she reacted similarly when Suijin called, so he realized his jealousy was unfounded. However, he couldn't help feeling irritated that someone else could make her happy and laugh. Ajiro recognized his deep love for Itsuka, but their relationship seemed to be hitting a roadblock. Despite occasional kisses, he felt like he was always initiating them, and while her hugs were friendly, they lacked the intimacy he craved. Itsuka. Life went on without any major shifts or epiphanies. Although she was still dating Ajiro, she sensed herself growing apart as he appeared more invested in the relationship than she was. She couldn't help but notice that whenever she brought up Izuku in conversation, both Ajiro and Jiroda seemed irritated, with Ajiro either rolling his eyes or abruptly ending the discussion. Jiroda appeared to object to an undisclosed matter, while Kanoko maintained a quiet demeanor. As days passed without any message from Suijin, Kanoko began to feel uneasy. When Izuku called inquiring about any updates, her anxiety heightened. During their shopping trip for a birthday gift for Izuku and a new book bag for Kanoko, the latter accidentally reveals that Ajiro is preparing for an important date. Itsuka had to persuade Kanoko to tell that Ajiro was planning to confess his love. Itsuka knew she didn't feel the same way. She talked with her grandmother for a long time in the garden and knew she needed to end her relationship with Ajiro. She tried to find the words the next day but was having a hard time getting him alone. He was so deep in the planning for this magical night he had planned that he couldn't or wouldn't see the look on Itsuka's face. Also, Itsuka took her time to call and message Suijin whenever she could. Kanoko did her best to support Itsuka as she could see the worry on her friend's face. Kanoko also tried to dissuade Ajiro, explaining that this might not be a good time as Itsuka was worried about her friend and that she had a bad feeling. Jiroda, on the other hand, was commenting on how it was likely that Suijin and Izuku had probably broken up, and he was trying to spin the narrative. Itsuka was walking into town to meet with Ajiro. She had to stop this before he confessed or did anything else. She was also watching her phone to see when it would connect so she could hopefully get an update on Suijin. She saw Ajiro waiting for her at the corner, her palms were sweaty, and she felt nervous and terrible about what she was about to do. As she was getting closer, she phoned and chimed as it connected. She looked down, no texts, one missed call, and one new voicemail. Putting her phone to her ear, she joined her voicemail, Izuku. His voice told her something wasn't right, call day or night, he said. With a shaking hand, she hit the speed dial. Ajiro and Itsuka. He saw her walking toward him. He was nervous, hoping everything would go right tonight. He pulled the flowers out from behind his back and was about to call out when he saw her holding her phone to her ear. She was close enough to hear her talking. Hi, Izuku. Of course, she is talking to that bastard. Oh god, Izuku no, no, no. Please tell me everything is okay. He stopped at that. What is going on? What's going on? Come on, I need you to answer me. He saw Itsuka stop walking, and she suddenly began to sob. He immediately went to her. A daughter. It's Inari, isn't it? Ajiro stopped. He had heard Itsuka mention that name before, but about Suijin, he remembered Itsuka showing him some photos of the girl with a child. I know, Izu, I miss you too, I'm coming home, I promise. I will stay this time, you won't be alone. He was entirely at those words. Just like that, she abandoned him and went back to Izuku. I can transfer schools, some things are more important than a dojo like you and Inari. I will be there soon, I promise. I know this sucks, but I have to go. I need to. Itsuka looked up and saw Ajiro standing near her. Same, Itsuka said and hung up the phone. What happened? He managed to say. Itsuka wiped at her tears, doing her best to compose herself, Suijin was killed. I am sorry, Itsuka, she had a daughter. Yay, it was that little girl she had been babysitting, and Ari, it is her and Izuku's. She never said anything to either of us. You're leaving. I have to, Ajiro. What about us? Itsuka took a deep breath. Kanoko told me what you had planned, and I had been trying to talk to you the last few days. I am sorry, Ajiro, I don't feel the same way you do. There was never the same spark for me that there was for you. We have much in common, and I thought it might develop, but... So, you will abandon your friends and take over your family dojo for Izuku and some kid you never met. You don't understand Ajiro, he has nothing left, now he has to raise a daughter. He needs help. How is that your problem? Why have you run back and thrown us all away for him? 
He is my best friend, Ajiro, my other best friend just died. Friends support each other, if I asked him to, he would drop everything and be there for me, how can I not do the same? I am not trying to throw you all away, I am sorry I wasn't more truthful with you and how I felt about us. I care for you as a friend, and that is all, I should have said something sooner. Yay, I am sorry too. He spat out. I have to go, Ajiro, I am sorry, Hitsuka said, breaking into a light jog as she headed home. She managed to get halfway home before she found herself sitting on a log and just started sobbing. Ajiro, he didn't want to head home. Instead, he headed towards Jiroda's house. His friend knew something was amiss when he opened the door and the devastated look on Ajiro's face. Jiroda ushered him into the house and to his room. What happened? Ajiro. She dumped me to run back to Izuku. He called her and told her he missed and needed her. Next thing I know, she is dumping me, saying she didn't feel the same way, that she just cared for me as a friend. How could she say that? You guys were together for a while, it was probably that asshole meddling this entire time. Check this that girl Suijin was pregnant with his kid, said nothing, then she was in some accident. He calls her, crying that he has to raise his kid, and guilts her into running back. She will quit her training to take over the dojo to do this. He is manipulating the fuck out of her. What a total piece of shit. Itsuka. When she got home, she ran to her room to cry her eyes out. She didn't go to school the next day because she was too emotionally drained. She argued with her grandfather about leaving to return home. Her grandmother interfered and settled things. The following week was difficult as she had to arrange her transfer and tell her parents she was coming home. Her father surprisingly supported her decision. He did tell her that she could always finish whatever training her grandfather had later to inherit the dojo. Ajiro and Jiroda had cut her off completely. Kanoko would still talk to her. The girl wanted to know what had happened. Not wanting to be completely alone, Itsuka told her that the mushroom girl was a true friend and offered Itsuka much needed comfort. Once everything was in place, she reached back out to Izuku. Itsuka, hey Izuku, sorry for the silence. I was getting some things sorted, I am coming home as promised. I will be there on Friday. Izuku, I feel terrible that you are abandoning your life there for me and Inari. You don't have to. We will figure it out. Itsuka, some things are more critical. Izuku, you need someone to back you up. Izuku, not that I don't appreciate it, but what about your training? Itsuka, if I'm being honest, I'm worried about you. I worried about Inari, and I can't be here anymore. My mind is too jumbled up now. I need to be around my friend. I know you are putting up a front. I am too. Izuku, thank you, Itsu. It would be a lie to say that I haven't missed you and couldn't use your help. But still, Itsuka, this is my choice, Izuku, my life. I chose to come home and be near you in Inari. I hate to say this, but you're not drinking again, are you? Izuku, no, I haven't touched it. I want to. I do, but mom and Suijin are watching. I have Inari and don't want her to get taken away. Itsuka, don't worry about it. I got your back. I see you soon. Izuku, thank you again, Itsu. I cannot even tell you how much I want to see you. She ended the call and sighed heavily. She walked over to her favorite coffee shop and grabbed a drink and pastry. I can do this. I can be the friend he needs. For you, Suijin. Izuku, it will be nice to have her back. I feel bad she is giving up on her life there to come home for Inari and me. She is coming home for us. I need to ensure I am doing okay when she arrives. I could get Inari out of the house and take her on a run. The fresh air will be good for me. Izuku got Inari into her running stroller and left the house. Finding a rhythm took him some time, but he soon got the hang of it. He had to stop a few times to deal with Inari, but his daughter seemed to enjoy the experience. He stopped and checked pricing at a few of the daycares he encountered. Shit, that is expensive. Also, I didn't like the teacher in the second place, the way she looked at me after I told her Inari was my daughter. Just from the cost of daycare alone, the job at UA looked more attractive to the young father. He stopped at a cafe to get some breakfast and feed his daughter. The waitress had known him since he was young and sat and talked to him for a few minutes. They exchanged numbers as the woman was a mother of three girls and had offered to give him advice. When he noticed some extra bacon and potatoes when he said something, she just pointed to the cook, who gave him a thumbs up. He saw the strange looks he was getting being so young, jogging with a stroller on a school day. On top of it, he heard the snarky comments as he made his way home from people judging him. Once he arrived home, he cleaned up, started laundry, and cleaned before he got a message that Kobayashi was on his way. When the lawyer arrived looked around the house and seemed pleased, he asked to hold Inari, and Izuku chuckled when the little girl seemed to snuggle in and fall asleep. They moved to the girl's room to talk while Izuku finished preparing everything for the painters and movers. So, how is the contract? Not bad, generous. I wouldn't say I liked a few things, so I returned it for revision. We managed to get it straightened out rather quickly. That's part of the reason I am here. Okay, go ahead, or did you want me to stop? No, you are not so dumb that you cannot focus on two things simultaneously. Thanks, I guess. It is very generous, concerningly so if I am being honest. The wages are good, the medical is great, and dental, everything is top-notch. What concerns me is that the principal is playing a different game. But he is crafty, so I must find out what it is. The term is three months, with automatic renewal after that. Written in, you will have received a passing grade from Mrs. Asui and Hound Dog. Should you enter UA? 
you must be in the top five of every class. Also, once enrolled, you must prepare dinner for your class twice weekly and handle simple repairs. In your personal opinion, should I take it? As your legal counsel, Midoriya, I believe it's important to hear your opinion before expressing my own. I never want to influence your decision-making process unless you may be at a disadvantage or about to make a significant mistake. I agree with you. The pay and benefits offered are excellent, and it fulfills all my requirements. The therapy aspect is a bonus since I could use some help. However, I'm not entirely sure what my job responsibilities will be, and I feel the principal has other motives. Nevertheless, I can't afford to turn down this opportunity without considering the financial implications. Considering your recent completion of high school and lack of practical experience, it may be challenging to make it work with just a job. However, we could manage with some effort, albeit with some financial restrictions. The donation has significantly helped you progress quickly without taking it slow. So, your opinion then? Midoriya, this is the most viable option to ensure Inari's well-being in the long run. While it may only provide a temporary solution for the next year, it should provide stability for you and Inari during your time in UA. Rest assured that Inari will be taken care of. Okay, I give you permission to accept the terms on my behalf. I have the papers in my briefcase, Kobayashi informed Izuku, as he gently passed the sleeping girl over. At first, she stirred and seemed to protest, but realizing it was her father holding her, she settled back into a peaceful slumber. As the painters and movers arrived to transform the home, Izuku felt anxious as he watched some of his mother's belongings being taken away. The hardest part was when the clothing was taken away to be donated. He held on to some pieces as they had sentimental value. His mother's wedding dress being one of them, and some sweaters, the one he had awoken to clutching when he decided to get sober. It was hard to let go, and knowing he would sleep in that room also caused his emotions to flare. It was strange to see his childhood furniture being removed as well. The day was busy as his new mattress had arrived, and Inari was not fond of the noise. Kobayashi provided them with the necessary details for the funeral and outfits for Izuku and Inari. After everyone had left, Izuku and Inari were put to bed in their room for the night. He stood in his daughter's newly painted room, admiring the light pink walls with gold trim and dolphins painted on the walls with aquamarine eyes. Izuku shed some tears but eventually composed himself. He then looked at a picture of himself, Inko, and Suijin on the wall. Thursday was another blur. Inari was not happy with all the stuff being brought in and assembled. He managed to get in his run. Inari had been cranky all day. She had decided that today would be the day her daddy would have to experience all the fun. The furniture people had just left when Mrs. Asui showed up. The woman observed Izuku as he tended to his fussy daughter. Seeing him struggle after four days, she took compassion on him and offered guidance to soothe Inari. She explained that the changes, such as being away from her mother and adapting to a new environment, were causing distress. Following the woman's advice, they wrapped Inari in her blanket, and Mrs. Asui sang to her, which helped to pacify the baby. After seating Izuku down, she shared with him her observations about Inari's preferences, the areas where he could improve, and the changes in her behavior. She also mentioned the types of food that Inari enjoyed, such as Cheerios. Based on her routine, he realized that sticking to her schedule was crucial. Izuku expressed his gratitude towards her, and she glanced at the peacefully sleeping Inari before returning her gaze to him. Dear Mr. Midoriya, my top priority is the success of Inari, but I also want to see you succeed. Rest assured that I believe in you and will always strive to act in all parties' best interests. Thank you, Mrs. Asui. Standing up, she returned his daughter to him and offered him a card. She quickly jotted something on it before handing it over. Feel free to give me a call if you need any assistance. The system is currently overloaded with parentless children, and I'd be happy to help you avoid that outcome. I'll be conducting a surprise inspection on Saturday around 8 a.m., and don't worry, the first one is on me. You'll have to wait and see about the next one, she grins. Good night, Mrs. Asui, and thank you again. After bidding farewell to the young father and daughter, Izuku picked up his little one and went to her bedroom. The room was beautifully decorated with white furniture, including a crib, dresser, changing table, and rocking chair. The floor was adorned with vibrant playmats and stuffed animals. A lovely portrait of Suijin was hung on the wall above the crib, so their daughter could always be under her watchful gaze. It was indeed a fantastic sight, a testament to the artistic skills of Kobayashi. All right, princess, let's see how you like macaroni and cheese. The day before the funeral, Izuku received notice from Itsuka that she was arriving on the evening train and would be at his house by 6 a.m. to help him prepare for the ceremony. Izuku had a restless night, plagued by disturbing nightmares. At 2 a.m., they woke up and reached towards the ceiling, calling out for Suijin. At 4 a.m., they even cried out for their mother. In a particular dream, they saw Suijin cradling Inari while Izuku rested his head on her lap. The dream caused him to cry and wake up once again when his alarm went off at 5 a.m. After getting up, they ensured Inari was still asleep before showering. While staring at himself in the mirror, attempting to find any motivation, it was not to be found. His phone lit up as he sat at the table with a cup of coffee. Itsuka, outside. She rushed towards him as he opened the door, and they both broke down in tears. They collapsed to the ground, embracing each other tightly. She expressed her regret for not being there for him, while he reassured her that it was okay and shared how much he missed Suijin. 
Amidst the jumbled words, they tried to console each other. It was only when they heard a cry that they regained their composure. Itsu, would you like to meet your goddaughter? Itsuka whipped her eyes. I would want nothing more, Izu. Itsuka. As she trailed behind him in the hallway, she couldn't help but admire her goddaughter's room. Observing Izuku lift the baby from the crib, change her diaper, and dress her in a comfortable onesie, she couldn't resist watching in awe. Finally, he turned to her. Itsuka, this is Inari. Inari, this is your godmother Itsuka. She fell in love at first sight. The little girl was staring at her, those beautiful eyes, a perfect blend of Suijin and Izuku. Izuku smiled at her. That is not fucking fair. Slowly she extended her hands to Inari. The little girl looked at her hand and seemed to be thinking before she leaned forward into Itsuka's hands. She likes you. It is because she knows a sucker when she sees one. They exited the room and made their way to the kitchen. Izuku made them some breakfast. Inari ate eggs and nibbled on toast. Itsuka ate a little and enjoyed a cup of coffee. She and Izuku talked. He filled her in on everything that happened when Inari showed up. Wow, that's a lot. Is there anything I can do, Izuku? He sighed. There is a half bottle of booze in the second box in the closet right hand side. Can you take it and dump it out? Of course. She went fished it out and got rid of it. Do you have anything else hidden around? No, I promise. I knew that the bottle was there. I managed to avoid temptation yesterday, but I don't think I will be able to do so tonight. Does that make me weak? No, Izuku. You managed to stop on your own. The temptation to fall back is always going to be there. It's good you could recognize that you should have it around and ask someone for help. Thanks, Itsuka. Izuku. The morning was much easier with Itsuka. Holy shit, two people are so much easier than one. Itsuka got Inari dressed while he got into his suit. Her parents arrived with Itsuka's clothes. She went into the room to change while Izuku caught up with them. They made a big fuss over Inari. Inari did not like Itsuka's dad and cried when he held her. Dad quite scaring Inari, came a yell from the bedroom. Now looked like a deer in the headlights. His wife, Hina, just laughed and took Inari back. Inari immediately stopped crying. Itsuka came walking out. Hey Izuku, can you help with the zipper zipper glowed green and zipped up? What did you do, old man? Nothing. I just wanted to hold her, and she started crying. Izuku laughed. It was his first laugh in days. It felt so good. The ceremony was a quiet, summer affair. He was joined by Itsuka, her parents, and even her brothers showed up. Kobayashi, Mrs. Asui, Nezu, Hound Dog, and Toshi were there. Itsuka sometimes had to help hold him up while her mom held Inari. He knew this day was coming, but the reality was crashing into him hard. Eventually, he just had his arm around Itsuka's shoulders while she had an arm around his waist as they both cried. They returned to Izuku's house and ate. Inari was, of course, the center of attention. Having some lovely memories built on such a sad day was pleasant. Nezu and Hound Dog left first. Nezu informed him that he had the job, and they wanted him to start Tuesday. Itsuka's brothers followed, then Kobayashi and Mrs. Asui. Izuku pulled Itsuka aside. I know this is weird. Could you spend the night? I can sleep in the spare room. Of course, Izuku. When she informed her mom, her mom smiled and brought an overnight bag from the car. I figured as much, sweetie. Toshi hugged him, allowing Izuku to get some tears out. Do as best you can, Izuku, I will see you Tuesday. Thank you, Toshi. Once they were alone and Inari was in bed, Itsuka held him on the couch as he cried himself to sleep. Itsuka gently laid him on the sofa before covering him with a blanket. She stood and made herself into Inari's room. She maneuvered the rocking chair near the crib. She leaned over and whispered, So, Angel, I'm standing in the family dojo, and in walks the green string bean saying he wanted to learn to defend himself. Izuku. Izuku rolled over, expecting to find more bed. Instead, he encountered open air and the sudden knowledge that gravity was still working. As his eyes began to focus and the slit throbbed from his sudden drop recited, he found himself on the floor next to the sofa. He remembered sitting with Itsuka, the events and emotions of the day prior, the overwhelming feeling and sense of loss, and that was it. He must have fallen asleep on the couch, and Itsuka left him there. He noticed that he had not brought out the baby monitor. He quickly got up and worried that he had slept through Inari's crying or her wet diaper. Mentally chastising himself, he went to Inari's room. Hearing nothing, he quietly opened the door. He immediately saw Itsuka, having pulled the rocking chair next to the crib fast asleep, carefully so as not to make too much noise. He walked over to look inside the crib. Inari was fast asleep, having kicked off her blanket, showing the only sign of any distress. Her diaper appeared dry, so he covered her back up and watched her for a few minutes. Turning his attention back to Itsuka, she looked peaceful in the chair. He loathed to disturb her but knew she would wake up sore from sleeping there all night. Gently he worked his arms under her to lift her into a bridal carry, hoping not to wake her. Once he lifted her, he was surprised when she lifted her arms around his neck, and he heard a contented sigh escape her lips as she snuggled closer, her breath tickling his neck some. She felt so warm, and her arms around his neck felt nice. He maneuvered his way out of the room and down the hall to his room, knowing his new mattress would be more comfortable. Some quick uses of his quirk to open the door and turn down the bed allowed him to lay her gently to rest. He was momentarily concerned when she let loose a grunt as he disentangled her arms from his neck but was relieved when she rolled over, grabbed his pillows, and drifted back off to sleep. 
He covered his sleeping friend before leaving the room, remembering to bring the baby monitor. Itsuka. She was walking through a field of wildflowers, the petals gently tickling her ankles. The sun was bright almost blindingly, but there was a gentle warmth. It was as if being wrapped in a perfect hug warmed her deep in her soul. Soft laughter danced around her on the wind as she turned to find the source, it was always outside her peripherals. The laughter wasn't mocking. It was joyous and filled with the promise of tomorrow. Itsu, a familiar voice called to her. Turning and smiling, there was Izu, older and even more handsome. From behind him, a little boy with orange-red hair and freckles with emerald eyes ran up to her, calling out, Mommy. As she wrapped the little boy in her arms, love just erupted from deep in her soul, Izuku stepped closer, slipping his arm around her waist. She tilted her head up as he came leaned down as their lips gently touched her mind erupted in sparks of fantasy, love, and lust. Itsuka. A new voice interrupted. Suddenly, her son and Izu were gone, as were the wildflowers. They're standing before she was Suijin, battered and bloody. Itsuka reached out to her. Wait, I can explain. Can you? Suijin turned to leave as darkness crashed all around Itsuka. She bolted upright, covers falling from her as she got her bearings together. She was in a strange room in bed, quickly checking herself. She was still in the same clothes as last night. She placed a hand on her chest to calm her pounding heart. She pulled her knees up to her chest, hugging them close, the dreams of what a kiss should linger, and the sound of Suijin's voice echoed in her mind. I am so confused, I thought I was over this or I've been able to put it behind me. But I still feel for Izuku, we buried Suijin yesterday, and I am dreaming of him again. This isn't what Izuku needs right now, I need to get myself together, be someone he can lean on, and help him with Inari. Looking around, she summarized that she must be in Izuku's room. She rationalized that her mind had picked up on his scent, which triggered the dream. Did he carry me in here? She thought. The image of him gently carrying her in a bridal position into the room and laying her on the bed invaded her mind, and her heart thumped hard against her chest. Shaking her head, she rose from the bed and gently opened the door. You are my sunshine. My only sunshine. You make me happy. When skies are gray. You'll never know, dear, how much I love you. Please don't take my sunshine away. Izuku's voice drifted down the hall, singing the simple song. His voice was soft and warm. She could hear the sound of giggles and baby babble accompanying it. Quietly she made her way down the hall to peek into the kitchen. The other night, dear, as I lay sleeping, I dreamed I held you, in my arms. When I awoke, dear, I was mistaken. So I hung my head, and I cried. Standing in the kitchen holding Inari was Izuku, gently swaying and singing. She noticed how Inari looked up at her daddy with a mesmerized gaze at the song. Izuku was plaiting some food one-handed and through the usage of his quirk. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy, when skies are gray. You'll never know, dear, how much I love you. Please don't take, my sunshine is away. He had walked over to the high chair near the table, the plate of food following behind him as he finished the song. He set Inari in her chair and kissed her on the forehead, setting the plate of food down in front of the little girl. Well, my princess, I present scrambled eggs, French toast cut into sticks as you prefer, bacon, and your favorite fruit. Would you care for some apple juice this morning? Yes, Inari's tiny voice rang clear and accurately. As you wish, he said, setting the cup on the tray. Itsuka felt an all-too-familiar thump inside her chest. Turning, she made her way back down the hall and pulled the bedroom door closed to announce her arrival as it was. She walked into the kitchen as Izuku slid a plate of food down on the counter, her eggs over medium instead of scrambled, remarking how he remembered that detail. Instead of apple juice, a nice cup of hot coffee was placed next to her plate. Itsuka, one true vice, was coffee, the aroma wafted through the air to fill her nostrils, causing her to smile as she sat. Morning Izu, and good morning, Inari. To Itsuka's glee, the little girl smiled and babbled back to her before returning to eating eggs. With great joy, Itsuka watched as Inari lifted the spoon full of eggs, losing 80% back to the plate, before plopping the remaining 20% in her mouth. Inari was beaming. Thump. Itsuka took a bite of her breakfast and offered compliments to Izuku as he sat across from her and near Inari to eat himself. How did I end up in your room? She asked. Well, I woke up by falling off the couch. Itsuka laughed, making Inari laugh, and Izuku smiled. I had a small panic attack thinking I may have slept through Inari crying, so I checked on her and found you sleeping in the rocking chair near the crib. Yay, I was just telling her stories, and I fell asleep, Itsuka said between bites. Well, after checking on my princess, I didn't want you to wake up sore, so I carried you to my room. You didn't wake up, so I tucked you in and started my day. You looked adorable asleep next to Inari, you watched over her all night. Thump. Well, I hope I wasn't too heavy for you, she said, daring him to take the bait. Nope, not at all, besides I work out, he replied while he flexed one arm. How are you this morning? Sad, maybe just slightly less than yesterday, but sad. I want to hear her voice again, talk to her about Inari and everything. Knowing that Inari won't have Suijin to guide her is hard, but I am thankful she has you. Thump the hardest part is when she calls for her, and there is nothing I can do or say that she can understand. I know I will have to explain in the future, and I don't know if that will make it worse or better. I will always be there for her and you, Itsuka said, squeezing his hand. He smiled and returned the gesture before returning to his breakfast. 
What is on the agenda today? Well, the first thing is that I have a surprise visit from child safety today. How can it be a surprise if you know about it? Mrs. Asui from yesterday, Izuku said, Itsuka nodded in acknowledgement. She is my case worker and told me the first one is free. It has more to do with how I am holding up after yesterday's events. What can I do to help? If you wouldn't mind bathing in Ori. That would be wonderful so I can get the dishes done and a few things taken care of. That seems simple enough, I will take one with her so we can both get clean. Itsu, yay, Izu. I know it sounds stupid, but I wanted to thank you for yesterday, for giving up your life and coming home to help me in Inari. I don't know how I would have gotten through yesterday without you. So, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Itsuka wanted to tell him not to worry about it, but she knew that was not the proper response, she paused momentarily. Izuku, I know if somehow, I was in the same boat or something terrible had happened to me, you would have done the same. Now where can I find her bath stuff? Izuku smiled fondly at his friend, her towel is behind the door, and all her products are in the bath on the ledge. Itsuka. She sat in the bath, bent her knees, and Ori resting against them, and splashed in the water. I understand why you said nothing, Suijin, but it's frustrating. On the bright side, your child looks fantastic. And Ori wasn't fussy or complicated, the child seemed home in the bath. She was very content to splash around in Itsuka's lap. Itsuka was marveling at the wonder and joy in the child's eyes. Her heart wavered some when Inari seemed to look around and said, Mama. Sorry baby girl, Mama is not here, but I will do my best by you, I swear. Although she wanted to sit longer, she was still determining the timing of the surprise visit. Therefore, she wrapped Inari in a towel and positioned her outside the door, notifying Izuku that Inari was ready from behind the slightly open door. She heard Izuku approach and collect Inari, and then she closed the door to prepare for the day. Upon exiting the bathroom, she witnessed Inari moving around the living room in her walker, adorned in a lovely dress and a little ponytail held in place with a clip. During Mrs. Asui's, it felt more like an inspection than a casual visit. Fortunately, she was content with Inari's cleanliness, recent bath, well-fed state, and tidiness of the house. As Izuku showed her around Inari's new room, Mrs. Asui confirmed that he had met the minimum requirements set by the state. She also provided Izuku with valuable personal advice and cautioned him about potential pitfalls to watch out for. During the next step, Mrs. Asui interviewed Izuku to assess his current mental state, any modifications to his future objectives, and financial matters. Upon learning about Itsuka's relationship with Inari's grandmother from Izuku, Mrs. Asui arranged an interview with the young girl. After the follow-up with Itsuka was set, the woman left for the day. Izuku turned to Itsuka, Itsuka, I am serious about you being Inari's godmother, I would like to put it into my will should something happen to me. So, if something happened to you, I would legally be responsible for Inari. Yes, Kobayashi would manage the estate and make sure you have money to help raise her, but I would want you to raise her if I were not around. I would be honored, Izuku, she said, wrapping him in a big hug. I will let Kobayashi know so he can bring you over the paperwork to read. Do you want to take Inari out? Maybe we can do some shopping, get her more clothes. That sounds nice, we can catch up. Although they hoped to go unnoticed, it was inevitable that they would draw some attention as they walked with a stroller. Sadly, in this society, young parents often receive strange looks. Fortunately, they didn't hear any negative comments. Izuku took the opportunity to catch up on everything that had happened while she was away, providing more detailed updates than their sporadic conversations allowed. So, you had two boyfriends and never said anything. They, you dated the second for a while. Why didn't you say something to me? To be honest, I have no idea, I think it was because I didn't know how I felt about them, so I didn't want to bring it up till I did, but with Ojiro, I should have ended things sooner. There wasn't a spark, or it never felt right, I keep thinking it was in my head. I understand that, but you should have said something sooner. You're right but let us talk about something other than my love life. Like, where are you going to get the little princess today? The trio spent the day together shopping and enjoying being around each other again. At the train, they separated as Itsuka had to return home to unpack and prepare for school on Monday. They embraced tightly as she boarded her train. Izuku and Inari. Sunday was a difficult day for Inari and her father. Inari continuously cried and called for Suijin, causing much distress. Despite attempts to soothe Inari, she continued to cry and fuss throughout the day. Even at night, she refused to sleep in her crib. Eventually, Izuku settled her down after he brought her to his bed. It was a heartbreaking experience for all involved. Monday was a better day for the young family. Inari was still fussy, but Izuku discovered that she had calmed down and enjoyed watching Disney movies, especially those with lots of singing by female characters. Even though she still murmured, Mama, she slept in her crib that night. She sweetly said, Night, night, Dada, when he put her to bed. This made him emotional. Once in his room, he cried silently into his pillow for the loved ones who were no longer with them. On Tuesday, Izuku began his new job at UA. He and his daughter, Inari, arrived early, but the morning train ride with a child stroller and diaper bag was a nightmare. Inari did not enjoy it. However, they arrived on time for Inari's health evaluation with Recovery Girl. She was in good health and up to date on her vaccinations. Izuku also met Mrs. Hamero, who was in charge of the daycare, and her assistants. Inari seemed to take to them well. 
The daycare closed at 6 p.m., and if Izuku were late, a report would be sent to the principal and child safety. During his orientation, Izuku helped out the staff and spent the day working with Lunch Rush. He made a good impression and enjoyed learning how to cook. Although some students looked at him strangely because he was younger, most were friendly. After lunch, he trained with All Might in Torino. Later, he picked up Inari from daycare, and she cried when she saw him. Mrs. Hamero explained that Inari missed him and her mom. Mrs. Hamero comforted Inari by placing her hand on her back, and Izuku saw a mental image of Suijin smiling and singing. Izuku combined the visuals of Suijin singing and the Disney princesses singing. When Mrs. Asui sang to Inari, the little girl was instantly soothed, and she appeared to relish it when Izuku sang to her while holding her. As a result, he intends to sing lullabies to her during bedtime to enhance the nighttime routine. As he neared his home, his neighbor Mrs. Koi stopped him and kindly gave him some delicious katsudon. She inquired about his well-being, and he gave her a brief update. She offered to help if needed, and he expressed gratitude for the meal. He caught up with his partner Itsuka about work and heard about her first day at school. He also shared his new bedtime ritual with their daughter Inari, singing her to sleep with a sweet lullaby. As he said goodnight to his little princess, she glanced at the photo of her mother above her crib and bid her goodnight as well. He experienced mixed emotions when he witnessed the act, which warmed and broke his heart. He could sense her emotional reaction when he informed Itsuka about it over the phone. They talked for about an hour, seeking a necessary distraction. When Itsuka yawned, he wished her goodnight and ended the call. Adjusting to a new routine can be challenging, but Izuku is skilled at following rituals and establishing habits. The initial week is the most difficult, but with Itsuka's assistance, they complete much shopping and prepare meals. While he takes a nap, she takes over some of his responsibilities. On Tuesday, Mrs. Asui visits him during the second week, providing support and understanding as he adapts to the new routine. On Thursday, instead of attending faculty, he has his first session with Hound Dog, which is challenging but a positive start. Over the weekend, Itsuka is there to help him with household chores, shopping, and being a listening ear. When feeling overwhelmed, he often turns to Itsuka for support. While he also reaches out to Toshi, he finds he can be more open and emotionally vulnerable with Itsuka. She creates a safe space for him to be honest about his feelings. It's a two-way street, as Itsuka shares her struggles with readjusting to life at home, making their relationship mutually supportive. They lean on each other, offering a helping hand whenever needed. There are even some weeknights when she sleeps over, helping Izuku with Inari or Izuku helping her with her schoolwork. Week 3. With the routine, Izuku and Inari would have recovered. As he settles into his job, he becomes adept at anticipating the preferences of the professional heroes. He manages to obtain some autographs from them as well. For instance, Midnight enjoys a sweet treat after her second class, while Eraser Head prefers to be left alone as much as possible. Ectoplasm tastes tart flavors, and Vlad likes his coffee strong and black coffee in the mornings. Recovery Girl is partial to English tea and biscuits, Cementos enjoys taffy, and Snipe prefers American lemonade. His training is getting back into the swing of things as well. With his learner's permit, Toshi takes him out to learn how to drive. Izuku, when you pass your test, I ask that you allow me to purchase a vehicle for you and Inari. Toshi, I don't know. That seems like a lot. Please, Izuku, allow this old man to do this, Toshi said, placing his hand on Izuku's shoulder. Izuku looks into the gentle gaze of Toshi, and he understands inside that this is what the feeling of having a father is like. Without thinking, Izuku hugs Toshi whispering a thank you as he does. Toshi, for his part, is surprised but welcomes the embrace, the two separates with a cough and a laugh. Inari is fond of Toshi and Torino, as the two men sometimes take turns walking. With Izuku after training to pick her up from the daycare, Inari always hugs and kisses her daddy first after greeting him with a hello before she wiggles out of his arms to whichever is walking with them. Izuku smiles as Torino always complains about the girl in his arms but will only hand her to Izuku once they arrive at the train station. During their daily routine, everything runs smoothly except when Inari is involved. She seems to enjoy causing chaos by interrupting whatever Izuku is doing and doing the opposite. Socks end up on the floor, shoes are refused, and she may even object to the color or removal of a shirt. Fortunately, Itsuka is a godsend and greatly assists in managing Inari's unpredictability. On the Sunday before Itsuka's departure, Inari took her first steps, abandoning her habit of shuffling while holding on to things. Itsuka reacts like a proud mama, getting her to do it again while demanding Izuku record it. In their joy, especially Izuku's, he never considered that the agent of chaos had just developed a new weapon. Week 4. Like many points in life, it all seems to be going well until suddenly it isn't. Work was fine. It was the therapy session that went wrong. Izuku had a rough session with Hound Dog ending and Izuku storming out of the session. It affected his training, causing him to get critiqued by Torino more than usual, leading to a spat between them. That night Mrs. Asui came by when his agent of chaos daughter had just caused so much havoc, and Izuku was already afraid that it was terrible. He received an unfavorable report for the first time. It almost caused a panic attack in the boy as he suddenly feared that Inari would be removed from his care at that very second. 
Thankfully Itsuka arrived and calmed him down, and Mrs. Asui could sit down and explain to him that a negative report was not the end of the world and that it was not as if he was severely abusing or neglecting Inari. Mrs. Asui had a heart-to-heart -heart with Izuku and asked him to recount his day. As he narrated the unfortunate events, she empathized with him and comprehended how things had spiraled out of control. Being a caring mother and social worker, she patiently shared techniques with Izuku that could help him cope with such situations in the future. She also advised him on handling similar cases should they arise again, which she, unfortunately, predicted they would. However, she saw this as a valuable teaching moment and encouraged Izuku to make the most of it. Mrs. Asui was confident he would regain positive reviews by the next visit after she left. Itsuka set about reigning in the goddess of chaos and helping Izuku get his night in order at the very least. Friday night, he stopped for dinner with Inari instead of cooking at home. As he entered, he almost ran into Mitsuki, whom he hadn't seen since his mother's funeral. Behind her, he could see Bakugo and his father. Mitsuki looked at him and then noticed the girl in the stroller. Her eyes widened, and her mouth opened like she was about to say something. Instead, tears welled in her eyes, and she ran past him and down the street. Bakugo went to go after his mom. He stopped and glared at Izuku, not seeming to notice Inari. Izuku noted he was taller and had a noticeable scar on his right eye. He said nothing and continued past in pursuit of his mom. Masaru said nothing to Izuku. Instead, he set some money on the counter, instructing the woman to use it towards anything Izuku ordered. As he moved past Izuku, he said, I hope you have a good night, Izuku. Then he left as well. Upon arriving at the restaurant, Izuku calmly requested a table for two and was promptly escorted to his seat by a friendly woman who also provided a high chair for Inari. As he scanned the restaurant, he caught sight of Mrs. Asui and her family seated in a cozy corner booth. They made eye contact and exchanged a polite nod and smile before Izuku settled into his seat. The Asuis. Mr. Asui turned to his wife, noticing her acknowledgement of the green-haired teen. Who is that, honey? You remember the negative report I told you about I had to file yesterday? Yes, is that him? Why did that bother you so much? It was just a congruence of a bad day, everything was going bad. I felt bad for having to file it. He has potential and trying very hard. We have all had bad days, it is terrible. It coincides with a home visit, but it happens sometimes. Is that the case you were telling me about? The one you were telling me that you hoped he would win? Sue asked. I want to win, what are you guys talking about? Samadair voiced. I bet they are talking about work like always, Satsuki said sullenly. You know what, Satsuki? We do talk about work too much. So, no more talk about work tonight. We are here to celebrate my promotion and have fun. Can we have dessert tonight? The youngest Asui's asked. Yes, and afterward, we are all going to the movies, Mr. Asui said to the cheers of his youngest. Mrs. Asui smiled and kissed his cheek. It is nice that we are having a family night out. We haven't had one in a while. Sue thought, turning her gaze to the teen and his child. I hope mom is right about you. She is putting much work into your case. That sounds like fun, father. I would enjoy that very much, she said. Month 3. Everything is going well for Izuku. He made a breakthrough in training. His full cow is now at 25%. Hound dog sessions are rough and full of emotion that Izuku thought he had handled. Grief, anger, sadness, and survivor's guilt. His follow-up visits with Mrs. Asui had gone well as she had predicted. Once again, life was going well till it wasn't. After putting Inari to bed on a Friday night, he realized he had run out of diapers and apple juice, which was quite inconvenient. He hurried to Mrs. Koi's house, explained his situation, and gave her his spare key and the monitor. He requested her to keep an ear out for Inari while he quickly ran to the store. Mrs. Koi kindly agreed to help him out. He hurried to the store and purchased everything he required, even picking up a pint of ice cream to share with Inari the following evening. On his way home, he heard a voice from the alley that stopped him. No, stay back. A female voice rang out, he could hear the fear. Izuku set his bag down at the alley entrance and hurriedly followed the sound, trying to be as quiet as possible. The alley turned to the left, and they cautiously peeked around the corner, anticipating a potentially dreadful sight. He saw a beautiful woman with a spiky black ponytail wearing dirty white pants and a ripped red shirt, leaving her top mostly exposed except for her bra. She had a bruise on her cheek and cuts on the top of her chest and arm. She was holding a metal staff. He could see the panic in her eyes. It was painfully apparent what their intentions were. A man with a spider quirk, towering at 6'3 and well-built, stood before her. He had four additional spider limbs protruding from his back, each with sharp talons. Meanwhile, a man lay on the ground clutching his groin, with a black substance oozing from his body. Finally, a third man seemed ordinary, except for the large spikes jutting out from his shoulders. See, baby, why did you have to go and make it more difficult? Said Spider. I told you to stay away. If you leave now, I won't call the police. The girl said, trying to keep an eye on her three assailants. With what phone? Said the shoulder spike man as a clear liquid formed in his palm and seemed to consume the girl's purse. As the man Spider advanced, the girl's training vanished from her mind as she envisioned the terrible fate that awaited her. She attempted a clumsy swing, but Man Spider effortlessly deflected it with his elongated arm before delivering a powerful punch that sent her into the wall. Now, let's have some fun, boys. 
he said menacingly. In an instant, the shoulder spike was struck by a forceful flying kick that sent him hurtling into a nearby wall, rendering him unconscious. Izuku's movements were swift as he leaped and bounded off the walls, skillfully evading Spider's swings. He maneuvered past Spider with impressive agility and delivered a powerful punch to the secreting guy. As he attempted to surprise Spider with a sneak attack from behind, he was swiftly blocked by one of Spider's limbs, which caught him and hurled him into a nearby dumpster, causing it to crumple. Izuku noticed that the man had eyes with a compound lens, and he realized that he couldn't prolong the fight any longer, as the loud thuds from their blows would undoubtedly attract unwanted attention. Instead, he grabbed the crumpled dumpster and chucked it as hard as possible. The spider used his extra limbs to hold it and tear it apart. What he needed to prepare for was Izuku barreling in behind it. Detroit smash, knocking the man out. Izuku turned his attention to the girl who had managed to return to her feet, holding her head and wobbling from the blow. He heard her say, no, please don't do this. He saw her eyes roll to the back of her head, dashing towards her, he could catch her before she fell. Izuku pulled out his phone and called the police, not wanting to get arrested for vigilantism. He removed his jacket, wrapped it around the girl's torso, and raced off with his quirk still active, remembering to grab his groceries. Upon returning home, he breathed heavily as he placed the girl on the couch. He quickly rushed next door to express his gratitude to his neighbor and retrieve his key and monitor. Upon his return, he promptly retrieved the first aid kit to attend to the girl's wounds. Luckily, the cuts on her chest and arms were shallow and only required simple bandaging. Fortunately, there were no visible wounds on her head. He retrieved a t-shirt from his closet and slipped the girl into it as quickly and gently as possible. Retrieving a baseball bat from the closet, he placed it near her and his phone on the coffee table within her easy reach. Moving across from her and waiting for her to wake up. He didn't have to wait long as she jolted awake with a short scream. Looking around, she quickly saw Izuku and the bat, she grabbed it soon as she got to her feet and assumed a defensive stance. Who are you? What did you do to me? She panicked. I heard your call for help and came to your rescue. I understand that this may be a difficult situation, but rest assured that you are safe, he spoke calmly and soothingly. He even raised his hands to show he was unarmed, although it may not mean much in a world full of quirks. Why should I believe you? Just let me go, she shouted. It was then she heard a child start crying. My name is Izuku Midoriya, I have no intention of holding you. I heard you call for help, and that's what I did, those men are unconscious. Unfortunately, they destroyed your purse and phone, so I could not identify that you were accessing your emergency contacts. I called the police, the child you hear screaming is my daughter. My phone is on the table in front of you. It is unlocked, and you can call whomever you want. Please calm down for just a minute. I know what happened had to be quite traumatic. He circled, keeping a wide berth, and went down the hall. As she listened, the sobbing gradually grew louder before tapering off. When he came back, he held a weeping toddler who appeared to be younger than two years old. This is my daughter, he announced, stepping away from the frightened woman and returning to his previous spot. The woman's mind was racing, processing everything that had happened. She had been bandaged and was wearing a t-shirt that wasn't hers. Her shirt was still underneath. If he were planning something, he would unlikely come holding such a small child. She thought, I brought you here, bandaged you up. Sorry, your shirt was destroyed. I just put you in one of mine. The cuts look shallow, and there was no cut on your head. I am sure that you want to go to the hospital. I brought you here because I used my quirk to stop those guys. I didn't want to leave you in the alley, and I didn't want to get arrested for vigilantism, as you can see why. He gestured to his daughter. You can call the police if you want, though I ask that you don't, I understand if you do. Where is her mother? The girl asked. No longer with us, Izuku replied. I am sorry. It is just fine, considering your night, I promise I will not hold it against you. Is there anyone you can call? Yes, she lowered the bat and picked up the phone, quickly dialing a number. Hello AI, yes this is me, there has been an incident. I need you to come to pick me up. Izuku provided the address. Please bring me a change of clothes as well as Vigo. She hung up the phone. Do you have a name? Momoye Yurazu. I know this is the dumbest question ever. Are you okay? It has been a terrible night, but I survived. He saw the desperate demeanor she was trying to maintain begin to crumble as the word survive seemed to drive home her ordeal. The bat tumbled free as she began to sob. Izuku, still holding Inari, slowly sat beside her and gently placed his arm around her. She stiffened up and then collapsed into his shoulder. He did his best to reassure her that the worst was over and that she was safe. As she opened her eyes, she looked into small teal eyes. Momo wiped her tears as the little girl looked up at her leaning forward and placing her hands on Momo's arm, seemingly trying to pat her arm to comfort her. What's her name? Inari, Izuku said, keeping his voice soft. Hello, Inari, how old are you? 22 months, said in a higher voice bringing a small smile to the corners of Momo's mouth. Inari began to babble at Momo, providing a sweet distraction till there was a strange knock at the door. Momo sat up and said clearly, I have seen the sunrise in the west. Izuku raised an eyebrow. The door opened to a man with no hair and black eyes in a crisp black suit. He had a collapsible nightstick in his hand, a woman with blue hair, a chauffeur outfit, and a bag. Momo rose and took the bag. This is AI and Vigo. 
Is there someone I can change? Of course, you can use any of the bedrooms or the bathroom at the end of the hall on your left, Izuku said. The woman followed Momo while the man sat there watching Izuku. It was quiet. Soon Momo returned in a fresh set of clothes. I will launder your shirt and return it. Izuku Midoriya, thank you for saving my virtue and, I am sure, my life. And thank you, Inari, for calming me down. She bowed from her waist. I will be pressing charges against those men, but I will not reveal your involvement. I owe that to you and this precious one. Thank you again, Midoriya. You are welcome and thank you for your discretion. Good night, Yeyurazu. Bye, bye Inari chimed in. Momo gave a small smile bye, bye Inari. The group left the house and Izuku let out a deep breath, turning to look at Inari. I will never run out of diapers again, I promise you that. Inari giggled as Izuku took her back to her room to try and get her settled down. Momo sat in the back of the limo as AI drove towards the hospital. She gazed out the window, wiping some stray tears as city lights flew by. Thank you for joining us on this incredible journey through what if Deku became a dad at young age. I hope you found it as intriguing and thought-provoking as we did. A big shout-out to Lestat719 for crafting such a compelling story. Don't forget to check out their profile on fanfiction.net for more amazing works, the link is in the description below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and don't forget to subscribe to Deku Fanfic for more fascinating explorations into the world of fanfiction and fantasy. Your support helps us create more content like this, and we're always excited to hear your thoughts and suggestions in the comments section. See you guys in the next video.